thank you, uh, Dr. Ash, for inviting me uh, to give this presentation and workshop. Um, and thank you for making my job so, so much easier by thoroughly reviewing the anatomic uh, landmark for uh, the classification of the standard of infinite. So the, among the skills that's needed to uh, do EBUS, um, one of the most important is to identify the lymph node stations. Uh, first, to be able to go where you, know, you want to do your biopsy um, and correlate it with the CT instead of keep looking uh, for all uh, the stations. And number two, to provide accurate staging. Uh, as Dr. Ashraf uh, mentioned, the location of the lymph node makes a big difference whether you're dealing with, um, uh, especially for the hyalur versus paratracheal versus subgrima because you're jumping from N1 to N2 lymph nodes and the prognosis will jump drastically. You're gonna move from a stage, in, a stage two cancer where you're doing uh, surgery and maybe chemotherapy after to maybe sometimes new adjuvant with surgery, depending on the situation, or no surgery at all. So the whole management will change depending on these subtle landmarks that, that Dr. Ashraf uh, covered in detail. The other skills required, the navigation of the oblique view, the handling of the needle, the handling of the specimen, uh, will be covered in other uh, part of this uh, workshop. So first, uh, we'll have uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ashraf already reviewed the media standard anatomy, so we'll have uh, with each slide just a, a, big, a small recap and then uh, going over the ultrasound landmark. Um, so this is the original classification of the lymph node station uh, by Mountain and Dressler that uh, I'm not gonna go over because Dr. Dr. Ashraf already covered. Um, and this is the more up-to-date uh, classification by the International Association of, for the Study of Lung Cancer um, that uh, also adapted the Mountain Wrestler and the uh, Japanese classification to have an international classification and be able to have uniform um, language. Uh, so I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go over all these stations that Dr. Ashraf went over thoroughly. Um, but just to mention that uh, the endobranchial ultrasound will be able to give you access to the lymph nodes that are surrounding the trachea, logically. Okay, so these are the lymph nodes that you could access with endobranchial ultrasound. Other would be, could be accessed by EUS, and we'll, we'll show you. So everyth everything around the trachea, the station two uh, and four, the upper and lower paratrachea. Is there one? So the upper and lower uh, paratracheal, station two, uh, and uh, the retrotracheal, 3P, uh, could be accessed by uh, EBUS, the subcarinum here, and uh, the hyper, the interlobar, okay, and the uh, segmental, so all of those. Um, once you go to 13, the subsegmental, it would be hard for the scope to fit in, uh, so it's hard to access them, and you can't access also all the station 12. You can do uh, all the 11, part of the 12, but not the 13. Uh, the lymph nodes that are not accessible by EBUS are 3A, so this is the prevascular, 5 and 6, the pre and subaortic, 8, paracetageal, and 9, the pulmonary ligaments. So these are here, this is the uh, paracetageal here, and the pulmonary ligaments here. And then you've got the uh, prevascular, that I showed you that they're on the other side, sorry, the uh, the prevascular and the priority there on the other side of the aorta and on the other side of the superior vena cava, so you can't get to them. I'll show you uh, images. Um, ELS FNA sometimes is used in combination or as a standalone uh, procedure to access some of the lymph nodes, so you can get to the subcarinal uh, here from the esophagus, you can get to the paracetophageal, the pulmonary ligaments, because they're in close proximity to the uh, esophagus. You can also access the left-sided mediastinal lymph nodes, so here 4L, but you can't get to the right side, and you get you can get to the 3P lymph nodes. 
So this is just a comparison of what uh, eBus could uh, get you and what EUS could get you. So in red here, this is what eBus get. So uh, everything surrounding the trachea, so left, left and right, paratracheal, even uh, some of the uh, supraclavicular sometimes you can get them. It's a bit hard and impractical. Most of the time it's much easier to, to do it uh, with an ultrasound uh, transcutaneously, so it doesn't make sense to use EPAS for that, but you can get to them. Um, and also here you can get to the subcarina, the hider left and right, um, and the interlobar, and uh, sometimes some of the segmental. For the EUS, you can get the left-sided mediastinum, the L over here, and then the subcarina, of course, parents regio, and uh, the pulmonary lung. So the main advantage here, here for uh, EUS is to get to these lymph nodes that you can get to uh, with EVAS. EVAS could get to the, uh, all the others. And of course, you can also get to the uh, posterior, posterior paratracheal, posterior paratracheal here with both EVAS and EUS. Surgical assessment is still needed, uh, mostly to uh, get to the uh, AP window, the station five and six to Chamberlain procedure. Um, but there's not major advantage over uh, endoscopic uh, use and uh, uh, EBUS and the US combination that showed to be actually superior to uh, surgical uh, assessment with bimedia stenoscopy. Okay, so, uh, and of course you require general anesthesia admission so you can uh, get to that. So mostly we use it for station five and six uh, with the Chamberlain procedure. Um, this is the um, important landmark that Dr. Ashraf uh, mentioned. I, I, probably the most important are the distinction between here, between 10 and 4R, be below the azygous on the right and above the pulmonary artery on the left. So once you cross the pulmonary artery upper border, we go from 4L to 10L, and that takes you from N2 to N1 disease, but here it's the natural, it's inside. And once you go from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the lower border of the azygous, then you can go from 4R to 10R. So that takes you from, uh, again, N2 to N1. This is a very important border to remember. This is important to know, but it doesn't change the prognosis much. So going from 2 R to 4 R, or going from 2 L to 4 L, is important, but will not change the management drastically. The other important board, uh, landmark to know is the left side, the sagittal plane on the left side of the trachea. And that plane will make a big difference. It will shift you from N2 to N3, from ipsilateral disease to contralateral disease. And there's no ultrasound landmark for it, so you just need to know where you're putting your scope. Okay, so anything anterior, the anterior border of the trachea, is going to be right, and of course the right side is right. The left, only the, the left wall is a left. Okay, so that would change the uh, prognosis drastically. This other landmark would change the prognosis drastically. The other important uh, finding is the subcarinal. So here, um, some of those right subcarinal and or sub subcarinal that used to be classified as hydra, and this has changed with the new classification. So this is also very important. So now we consider the subcarinal all this triangle here, down to the uh, bronchus intermedius, the lower border of bronchus intermedius, and here to the upper border of the left lower lobe. Okay, so upper border of uh, uh, intermedius, up. Lower border, sorry, intermediate, upper border of left lower lobe. So what's, all of that is subcarinal, and that's N2. So also you could upstage if you if you make a mistake. Sometimes also the higher lymph node is big and get to that space. So it's important also to correlate it with the CT to know whether you're dealing with an N1 or N2 disease. So um, when you're doing EBUS, you're relying at both uh, anatomic uh, landmarks that's used with uh, ultrasound and with endoscopy. All right. In the US, you don't have much um, at, you know, guidance by the endoscopic view, so you're mostly relying on your ultrasound. But when you're doing EBUS, you're relying on both. 
Okay, and this uh, cartoon here, super, it's a bit blurry, sorry, but it uh, superimposes the uh, vascular structure on top of the trachea. And this is what you need to be imagining as you go inside the trachea. So once you go past uh, the uh, vocal cords and you get to the upper part of the trachea, that's what you've got. Here we're dealing with the N2 upper mediastinal lymph nodes. And it's because you're on top of the aortic arch on the left, and here you're um, still above the superior vena cava. So you're still here dealing with the brachiocephalic veins and that comes in front of you and the, uh, on the left and the uh, right brachiocephalic veins. So before they join to do the SVC and on top of the aortic arch, you're dealing with the N2, okay? This is the um, uh, 2R and this is 2L. And if it's here, you're still 2R. And this is where you actually switch to uh, a 2L, okay? Um, down below, you can see the superior vena cava and the azygous. So when, once you move your bronchoscope down to the uh, lower trachea, now you're dealing with the azygous and the superior vena cava on the right. And you've got, you start to see the pulmonary artery on the front and um, the aorta. Uh, the, lower, the aorta would be here, the arch going between the ascending and descending aorta. And this is your 4L station, and the 4R station here at the level of the azygous and above it, and the sphere vena cable. And then for the, uh, and that would still also be 4R above the uh, pulmonary artery in the front. To localize the subcarino, you're going to use your endoscopic view, okay? And that would be very easy to uh, define on the carina exactly here, okay? So you use vascular structure to tell you where your 4R and 4L uh, nodes are. It's still in the trachea, lower part of the trachea. And you use your endoscopic view to get to the subcarina. This is on the uh, right side, it's uh, also similar on the left. Once you go inside the right main bronchus, then you're talking about hyla. Okay, then you move to N1 here and you're talking about 10. So 10 would be here at the uptake um, and of the uh, right main stem. Okay, this side of the airway, you're gonna be subcarinal. Okay, you know, it's not higher. And uh, at the secondary carina here, that's where you get to 11. Okay, the interlober. And then there's another interlober here that uh, I don't have an image for which is at the secondary carina that splits between the bronchus intermediate and the right main bronchus. But it doesn't make it, again, it doesn't make a big difference whether you're dealing with 11 or 12, but it makes a big difference between 10 and 7 and 10 and 4. That's, that's what you should focus on with your skill. Now, of course, if you know you're 11 and 12, it will, uh, you know, it will make your life easy. You'll get quicker to where you want to go. But as far as accuracy with the staging, the key landmark is what I told you the pulmonary artery, the azygous, and separating the hyla from uh, subterranean. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll go over each station by itself. So here, after you get your uh, past your vocal cord, it's one of the skills that you have to learn. With uh, That's your first anatomic uh, uh, challenge, is actually to get, to get past, past the vocal cord with the oblique view. So this is the view that you want to see, okay? The anterior commissure, you don't want to be seeing the vocal cord like this. If you've seen them, it means you have your scope is tilted, and it will, it will just go towards the esophagus, all right? It won't go in. In order to go in, in the vocal cord, that's what you need to be seeing. So once you're going, you're at the trachea here. In the upper part of the trachea, that's the realm of station two, okay? So once ab above, about the fifth ring, that's where you're working, okay? Just really a little below the vocal cord. And these are the station two that Dr. Uh, Ashraf already showed us. So again, the station one is not practical to be sampled by uh, EBOS. You can, you can, but it's a bit harder because uh, it's, it's a big, bit of a tilt. The, the bronchoscope is not very well supported. Um, and it's easier to get to them from the neck. Uh, with regard to two, so here you're uh, on the left. You're uh, above the aortic arch, and on the right, you're uh, above the intersection of the uh, innominate vein, the left innominate vein, and the trachea. 
this is the image that uh, Dr. Ashraf showed. So here you're between the uh, artery, the uh, um, carotid here on the left, and the brachiocephalic, and that's station two. This is 3A, that's prevascular. So this is right or left? Hmm? Right. right, so it's anterior, it's right. If it was here, it's right. And this is left, okay? So you have to go past this sagittal plane. You have to go past this sagittal plane here. So this would be left only. This is right, this is right. So this is your image, a bit of a correlation. Um, so here you can see the um, on the CT, the, the right uh, helmet vein or brachiocephalic, and you've got the lymph node here, aortic arch, and these are the uh, arteries coming up. And this is your bronchoscopic view. You just uh, pass the vocal cord, and you're pointing your ultrasound to the right. Okay, this is not real. There's a camera that's showing you. It's not what you actually see, but showing you where you want to put your scope. Uh, you've got the balloon, and that's the tip of your scope. Usually your vision is here, so once you're in this position, you're not seeing anything. You're just seeing the wall. You're against the wall. Um, so around the fifth tra uh, tracheal uh, ring, this is your ultrasound view, and this is what you see. So you've got the lymph node here, and then you've got the vein here, the right phenomenon vein. These are just artifacts. I will go over them in one of the uh, uh, lecture. Um, again, this is the, uh, now we're talking about 2L. Uh, you're on the left side, and it's the same, but you're just pointing the, the bronchoscope to the other side. Okay? And um, behind the 2L here, you, you have the left carotid, okay, and when on your ultrasound view, this is what you're seeing, the, uh, this is the uh, green dot is the upper uh, side of the scope, so you're, you're looking down from the green down, okay, um, this is your lymph node that you're seeing, and that's the left carotid behind it, okay, um, and if you want to puncture it, that's how your needle is going to come out, from, from the green dot out to this uh, lymph node, so you're going to do your measurement and uh, Try not to puncture the carotid artery. Station three, um, as Dr. Ashraf mentioned, the uh, prevascular, you can't get to them. They're in the anterior mediastinum, so you have the superior vena cava that's uh, superimposed or in between, so you can't get to them. But the retrotracheal, you could, from the esophagus or the uh, trachea. They're really rare lymph node. I think in all my you know, work with that, I've only did it a couple of times. And most likely, most of the time, it's a uh, uh, esophageal cancer uh, that's recurrent. That's usually the presentation. Someone had an esophageal cancer, and they had this lymph node. But it's very rare for the lung cancer to metastasize to this, uh, to this uh, station. So how does it look? This is the correlation between the CT and the ultrasound view. Uh, this is the 3P, the retrotracheal, it's sitting here, and the esophagus is probably squished here, okay? And this is how you're going to see it on the um, ultrasound. So you're going to put your scope a bit posteriorly. Sometimes you have to stand in front of the patient. Most of the time we do the uh, EBUS from, uh, from the back. The patient is on um, supine position because most of, the, all of the lymph nodes are anterior. Okay, so this is some of the rare situation where you actually may flip and stand in front of the patient so that your scope goes all the way to the membranous trachea. So you're puncturing the membranous trachea here, not the cartilage. Um, and uh, this is the view. Now, this is the prevascular lymph node here, and you can see the superior vena cava. And when you do the ultrasound, it's very nice. You're able to see them both. Sorry. So uh, this is your. Uh, this is the trachea here. This is your 4 r lymph node that you're seeing here, here and there. And this is your superior vena cava. And then this is the station 3A, the prevascular. So you're able to see them all, okay? But it's uh, not very, I mean, there's no point in, uh, in going through a vessel to get to that. <coughs> station uh, 4, we've already covered. Again, it's also for a tracheal, so uh, it's very easy to uh, visualize. Uh, these are just uh, different examples. So once you're past the aortic arch here, you, you get to the realm of uh, four. And uh, on the left uh, here and on the right, once you get to the sphere vena cava past the brachiocephalic, then you're passed from two to four. Again, not a big difference between the two, but um, 
more correct to state your right. And once you go uh, even below, as long as you're on top of the pulmonary artery, you still looking forward. So here are just different cuts to show you the extent of uh, uh, station 4R. So here you're um, on top of the azygous, and uh, this is a 4R with the superior vena cava. Here you're starting to see the azygous here, and this is the, again, the 4. Most of the flow doesn't go in the azygous vein, uh, the contrast. And here you're on the lower side of the azygous, and you're still 4R. With any, anything below that, now you're 10, now you'll be higher. And here, the same on the uh, left side, on top of the uh, pulmonary artery, you are four. And uh, once you go be below the uh, PA, then you're 10. So this is the endoscopic view, uh, the bronchoscopic view, sorry, the, uh, with the ultrasound for the uh, 4L. So what you're looking for is what they call the Mickey Mouse ears, okay? You're looking at, this is, the uh, upstream, so this is the aorta, and this is the pulmonary artery. Your ultrasound is stuck against the tree here on the lower side on the left, okay? And this is what you're seeing. The aorta is on top, the pulmonary artery is below here. There's not much, maybe there's a very small lymph node here uh, that I would be sure that it's hard to actually um, FNA. Um, again, this dot here, uh, green, correspond to this location, okay? So this green dot tells you that this is the aorta and this is the pulmonary artery, and your needle is gonna go this way. So again, Mickey Mouse is the 4L. That's what you look for. This is again the endoscopic view correlation with the um, um, CT, and again, aorta, pulmonary artery, lymph node in between, this is for L. Uh, here, you're not able to see, but you're very close to the carina. In the previous images, you were up in the trachea for uh, station two here, you're very low, um, and this is what you see. The problem with the EBUS is the ultrasound uh, you know, angle, scanning angle is not too big, so you don't see all the vessel. You have to move to see. So what you're seeing here, the aorta, you're seeing it uh, like a shadow here on, on the side of the pulmonary artery, you have to imagine that it's a whole vessel. Okay, and you can use the doctor to see the pulsation. And this is the lymph node sitting in between. That's, that would be that. So aorta over here, pulmonary artery over there, and the lymph node in between. The green tells you this is the this is your side. This is where it's coming down. <coughs> this is another image of the AP window with the uh, lymph node. Again, this is the uh, aorta and the uh, pulmonary artery and the lymph node in between. You can see even the cartilage rings here. Okay. And that may sometimes make it harder for you to, to penetrate. You can see that the needle here went in below the cartilage, through and through, and they actually overshot the, uh, the lymph node, so they're almost punctured the pulmonary artery here. And okay. then these are the uh, mouse ear loops. Station 4R is similar in the tracheal or tracheal on the other side, so that's your scope here. And before the uh, bifurcation to the uh, right main stem bronchus. Uh, your landmark here is the azygous vein. Okay, so the azygous vein is what you're looking for. Anything at the level or above is 4R. Anything below it is 10. Okay, and that's what you're seeing. The azygous is here. Okay, and this is the uh, 4R lymph node looking from above. That's basically correspond to what you're seeing here exactly. And again, this is the correlation between the uh, endoscopic ultrasound and CT views. This is your superior vena cava. Okay, this is the lymph node, the 4R lymph node all the way. It's a bit elongated here, above the pulmonary artery here. Okay, and the aorta on the other side. So you're looking here, you can look either anterior and or to the right, and that would be both 4R. And this is your lymph node, and this is the SVC. This is one, also one of the classic views in, um, in uh, EBOS. So you have the lymph node, and your SVC is below it. Okay? Now, depending on the level with the 4R, you may either see the azygous, similar to what I showed you here, okay? or the superior vena cava, similar to that. This is another color correlation to make things uh, a bit clearer. So you have the superior vena cava the lymph node for R and the azygous. And uh, 
here you're looking at the azimuth, so you're, you're probably just looking here. You have your scope looking here, okay, to the side. So if your scope is actually looking here, that's what you see, okay. Now you move your scope a bit anteriorly to actually where they punctured, okay. So here you're above the carina, this is the right uh, main stem, and that's what you see, okay. You've got the superior vena cava, the forearm. So this is a bit anterior, similar exactly to what you're seeing here. So this is exactly where they puncture over here. And, but when you look here, that's what you see, the hazardous. The lymph node could be here. It doesn't have to be anterior, it could be here on the side. And then what you're gonna see it, you're gonna see it in relation to the hazardous instead of the spirit of the So th there's two ultrasound views for the forearm, either with the hazardous or with the spirit of the This is another uh, view showing the puncture and showing the um, Doppler view here. So you've got superior vena cava under it, sometimes not very clear. You could increase the contrast here and uh, you'll have a better view. Um, again, with the endoscopic, you're not seeing anything on the, on the trachea, you're against the wall, uh, but the SVC is under it. Okay. Again, can't overemphasize the importance of the azicus vein, um, it makes a difference between 4R and 10R. Now, when you get to the uh, bronchus, the main bronchus on the right or on the left, you get to the tent. So you can see that once you get to the tent, now you don't have a trachea anymore. You have the actual bronchi. Okay. So to get to the um, hyder, the tent, you have to go in the uh, bronchus. You're past the trachea. So all this wall is here. Your azicus is here, and you're probably gonna puncture anywhere here or here or here. Okay. Once you get to the um, secondary carina, now you're 11. So you're not uh, 10 anymore. And with the main airway on this side, that's seven. Okay, so that's where you want to uh, puncture. And that's how it uh, looks like. There's no ultrasound landmark to help you here. Okay, so you're relying completely on uh, where you're putting your uh, scope and uh, the CT. So unlike the four, where you have all these vessels that guide you, that does you, this is, you know, with ultrasound where you are, here you don't have any ultrasound landmark. So you know you have to know where you puncture it. Again, this is a, a, a triple correlation with the uh, 10R here um, and uh, below the azigus, so you've got the azigus on the CT and the, uh, this is the right hyder lymph node. Your scope is all the way in the uh, main bronchus on the right. This is the secondary carina, actually. That's not the main carina. So your scope is is here. And uh, what you're seeing, you've got the azigus and you've got the lymph node on the other side. So it's below it. The NL is similarly, you just need to go in the uh, uh, left main stem. Okay? And uh, again, no landmark. As long as you're past the pulmonary artery, you may be able to see the pulmonary artery here on your way and then slide past it. And now you know. But that's your view, there's really nothing, there's just long being behind it or the time, but no, uh, no vessels to guide you. And uh, this is the triple correlation, as you see, you went uh, past the pulmonary artery, you're here, this is the 10 L, okay? And uh, here what you're seeing is the secondary carina, that's your left lower lobe, you're in the left main stem bronchus, and your ultrasound is on the upper wall. So you go in and, and your ultrasound is on the upper wall. Okay, and that's what you see, 10 L, and there's, uh, maybe you're gonna see the uh, pulmonary artery when you pass it. Station seven is also a station where you rely on your um, endoscopic view, not your uh, ultrasound a lot. Uh, you, if you're seeing the cardiac pulsation, it will help you to know that this is where you are, because you see the uh, atrium on the other side that's pulsating, I'll show you an image. Uh, actually, you can also see it here. So that's your uh, atrium. Um, these are some artifacts, not very important. And you can either puncture from the left or the right. Uh, if it's uh, high, subcarinal, it's equivalent. If it's low, then it will make a difference. So you can try both sides and decide from which side to puncture. Uh, this is the triple correlation view. So again, your scope here is, uh, and the main carinal, is here you're on the right side. And this is your left uh, main stem bronchus. So you see the lymph node here, very easy to, to figure out. And um, with your ultrasound view, 
we've got the left atrium here. And uh, this is a still image, but once you're doing ultrasound, you're actually doing like an echocardiography, and you're able to see, sometimes you're able to see the valve uh, or a pericardial effusion. There's case reports where people sample pericardial effusion during the EBUS. I've never done it, and, and it's, uh, it's possible. Um, so this is another view here. You're uh, on the uh, right side, the right carina, and you're seeing your um, uh, subcarina lymph node. This is the uh, left atrium, and that's your needle coming from the green dot to puncture. Again, just to emphasize the subcarina border that were changed and now go all the way to the lower border of the uh, bronchus intermediate on the right, intermediate on the right, and the upper border of the left lower uh, go uh, bronchus on the left. So this is your carina, this is where you want to sample all this wall, okay? This upper side here is for the 10 arm, and for the uh, 11, that would be either here for 11 superior or here for 11 inferior. These are the secondary carinas. So you put your scope against this wall here. So you just go, you see the, the ridge, you go under it. And same thing for the 11 eye. You see the, your, uh, the fish mouse of the right middle lobe and you just put your scope in the uh, right lower lobe uh, bronchus to get to that. Same thing on the left, you just have one uh, uh, 11 station. Uh, you see the secondary carina for the upper and lower. You push your scope, tip of your scope in the lower lobe and you can see the 11. So this is the 11 uh, R S, which is actually more, more commonly um, sampled. You can see it here. Uh, it's most of the time there's vessels on the other side. They're going to be the pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. Uh, this is your upper lobe bronchus, and this is how you're pushing your scope under it. So it's very easy if there's no intervening vessel. It's probably the easiest uh, lymph node to, uh, to puncture and has a better view. It's a good size. It's a very good lymph node to start working with. The only problem sometimes is you get these, uh, the pulmonary artery in the, uh, is in the way. Here you have the pulmonary artery on the other side, so it depends. Sometimes it's coming all the way this way. Here you have the pulmonary vein, so you have to really finesse it in between. Uh, that's uh, another view of the 11R. Again, there's no landmarks. It's you rely completely on the, your position of the scope, um, and you have the uh, vessel inside it. It's all surrounded by lungs. So this, these are uh, the snowstorm appearance of the lung and the V-lines with the uh, ultrasound that you also see on thoracic ultrasound. The 11R inferior, now you are uh, in the right lower lobe. So this is actually the secondary carina that separates it from the right middle lobe. So you put your scope in the right lower lobe and facing anteriorly, and then you'll be able to see it. And again, there's no landmark. It's just a uh, you know, a dull uh, circle sitting and then surrounded by lung. And uh, sometimes you can see a vessel, but most of the time this, is, this has less intervening vessels actually than the 11S. And that's where you're seeing it here. This is the right uh, middle lobe bronchus coming anteriorly. And you've got the uh, lymph node sitting there. The 11L is also very similar. So now you're just on the left side and uh, you have the left secondary carina. This is your upper lobe, uh, left upper lobe bronchus, and probably the lingula is here, but you can't see it. And this is the lower lobe, you've got the superior segment here. So you put your scope. Um, it's not very, this image is not exactly what you see, it's not very accurate, usually it's a bit twisted. So you've got the upper lobe uh, anteriorly. Um, it's probably gonna be, this would be here, and this would be here, usually. Um, and uh, this is your lymph node, again, nothing, no landmark. Sometimes you get a vessel uh, or two, and that's your lung with the V-lines. The key here is just not to go past it and puncture the lung, that's all. Uh, this is, again, uh, station 10. Uh, and that, that's just a recap of uh, these uh, stations. Uh, the 4, L, the Mickey Mouse, okay. The 7, you need your endoscopic view. The 4, R, you need the azimuth. Uh, the 10, left and right, you need to be in the uh, main stem bronchus on the right and the left. And for the 11, you need to go to the secondary carinas. So quite simple. Uh, that's a recap. Dr. Ashraf already mentioned the importance of the sequence of the staging. So if you want to do your staging, you want to go to the highest 
stage, now that you know your landmark, you need to go to the end first. So if uh, you have, there's adrenal, you could use EUS. EUS get to the stomach, and from the stomach you can get, you can see the left adrenal mostly, sometimes the right. Um, there's case report of EBUS actually reaching. The EBUS is shorter, so it can get to the stomach, and sometimes you can't see the adrenal. Well, so you go for this one first with M1. And then if you have, if you suppose your uh, tumor is on the right, if you have left-sided lymph node, you go for them first. So 4L or 10L, okay? If you don't, then you go to the N2, which are the mediastinal 4R or 2R and the 7. And the last thing would be to, to sample the hydro, the N1, okay? The, the key thing is to try to get to an N2 or an N3 lymph node and really be careful. Uh, if you contaminate, I mean, you have to go do the highest stage first because there's always concern of contaminating the needle. So, uh, you know, you go to the N3, if it's positive and you contaminate the N2, it's not a big deal. But if you do the other way around, then it's a problem. Contaminated, I mean, with uh, malignant cells. Uh, station 5 and 6, just to show, show you that uh, it's, uh, there's case report of people who got to them. Um, the scope doesn't bend enough to be able to actually uh, get to them from the uh, main bronchus, but from the trachea, this is how you see them. Um, and uh, most of the time, uh, the, the pulmonary, uh, the uh, aortic pulmonary ligament is actually here, but you don't see it with ultrasound to separate four L from uh, five. And this, uh, this is actually six. Uh, yeah, it is six. They call it six. And you have to go through the aorta, uh, which uh, I don't like to do. Uh, again, chamber lane procedure is needed to sample these lymph nodes. Uh, station 8, you can't get to it with a proctoscope, but you can get to it with the uh, EUS, and these are the views. Um, you can insert your uh, uh, EVOSCope inside the esophagus. Um, you know, some places they don't like to it, some people are territorial, uh, but uh, if you're okay, if you're a gastric your GI colleague, doesn't mind, and it's very easy. Many times by mistake you find yourself in the esophagus where the patient coughs a lot. Sometimes you just like, the view is clear, everything is okay, but you can't see anything endoscopically. You just see ultrasound views. So you can get to it by uh, EBOS, but you just need to go to the uh, esophagus here, and that's what you're seeing. And with that, I'll stop and take questions. <coughs> in your trachea, okay, all of this is two to sit up, okay, and three, you would have to turn your scope all the way, so this will be flipped, and you puncture here, you puncture this, this and side. Yeah, the membrane is part They're both, uh, you know, and one. Extremely rare, man. It's very rare. It's very rare. Mostly esophageal cancer related, not, uh, not lung, but there's no drainage there. Um, I've never seen it with uh, lung cancer. In all the cases have always, have always been. Uh, Don't imagine about the superior vena cava and the atlas. The superior vena cava appears like a tube, and the atlas appears like a cell. So this can differentiate when you have a trick that always when you have a, a tube, this is superior vena cava. When you have it circle, this is an atlas. This is an important point to put it while you are working uh, that you always, you, the superior vena cava looks like a tube, as you see. Yeah, this is the view. So the superior vena cava comes. And it's really the ultrasound picture like a tube. Like the ASICs will be done there of course. But that means the ASICs will be done there of course. One 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 لكن حضرت معاكم مره وشوفت الكلام من فتره في الحاجه مستمتع بيه جدا يعني. 
هنتكلم على الانجلش اكويبمنت احنا يمكن مش كونسيرنت قوي بالريديال برو بس انا قلت ان احنا فرصه ان نبني فكره عنه ويتهيألي ان هو ليه فيوتشر كويس ان شاء الله نشتغل بيه كتير هو لسه مش عندنا هنا في مصر يعني ما عندناش اللي هو الريديال بروب ما اعرفش مين جايبه لغايه دلوقتي بس بيتهيألي انا اشتغلت عليه قبل كده الريديال القديم فهيبقى ليه فرصه ان شاء الله في احنا عندنا هنتكلم على الريديال بروب وعلى الكومبلكس بروب اس ار اكويبمنت طبعا البرنسبل بتاعت الالترا ساوند يعني مش عايزين نخش في تفاصيل كنا عارفين السونار هو السونار اللي هو فيه سيراميك البروب السيراميك البروب دي بتبعت 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 الويفز وبتستقبلها في نفس الوقت ودي بيسموها البيزو الكتريك برنسبل ان هو بيبقى فيه الكتريك كارنت الكتريك كارنت بتعمل سيميليشن للسيراميك بارت فدي بتعمل فايبريشنز الفايبريشنز بتمشي في التشو بارت مننا بيحصل لها فلتريشن وبارتس بتبقى ايميت وبارتس بتبقى ريفلكتد وبارتس بترجع تاني بترجع تاني بقى اللي هي بترجع دي بترجع تاني عن طريق السيراميك بارت اللي هي وبعد كده بتبقى الكتريك كارنت والامبيدنس اللي هو الريزيستنس اللي موجود ده هو هو ده اللي بيرسم البوردرز بتاعت الصوره عشان كده الصوره بتبتدي تبان نتيجه الري الالترا ساوند اللي بتروح واللي بتبتدي الجزء اللي بيرجع منها والاكيوليشن والابزوربشن والريفلكشن اللي بيحصلوا دول بيتسموا صوره الاوردن اللي احنا بنشوفها ده ان سيمبل يعني احنا بنستخدم الايجوز ده يعني طبعا الايجوز ده احنا بنستخدم ايه الهدف من الايجوز هو بيورينا الاير هو عباره عن ان انت بتخش جوه الاير واي عن طريق الاندسكوب وتوريك الاندسكوبيك بيكتشر هتوريك الاندسكوبيك بيكتشر في ايه؟ هتوريك للبرونكي الاول هتشوف الاول بتاع الدرجات البرونكي الاول اللي هي الميكوزا والسب ميكوزا والكارتج والادفنتيشيا هيوريك الفاسلز زي ما الدكتور حسن ورينا الفاسلز والليمف نودز اللي حواليها لو في ليمف نودز في الميدياستاين حتى مش بتكلم على الليمف نودز هتوريها لك تاني حاجه ان انت ممكن كمان تدخل المنظار اللي هو الريديال جروب تدخله في البريفري تبين لك اللانك تاني فانت كده بتشوف اي حاجه ليها علاقه بالبرونكال في الول من اول الول لغايه ال ال الفاسلز اللي حواليها التيومرز لغايه الفرنكيما بتاعت اللون. عندنا نوعين من الاند بروك الالترا ساوند في حاجه اسمها الريدل بروك وفي حاجه اسمها الكونفكس بروك. طب ايه الانديكيشنز الاول قبل ما نخش؟ اول حاجه نشوف الدبس اوف التيومر انفيجن. يعني ايه الدبس اوف التيومر انفيجن؟ احنا عارفين الول بتاعت البرونكاي بيتكون من ميوكوزا وسب ميوكوزا بيتكون من الكارتريج ومن الادفنتيشيا ودول بيسموهم الخمسه ليرز. دول اللي موجودين في الهيستولوجي اللي احنا كلنا درسناها. طب ايه فايدتهم ان احنا نعرفهم عن طريق اند بروك الالترا ساوند؟ اند بروك الالترا ساوند هو بيقدر يحدد لك اللي هي زي الميكوزا والسب ميكوزا والكارتج اللي هي الحته البيضاء اللي في النص دي مهمه جدا وبعد كده الايه اللي هم توب بار ليفرز اوف الكارتج وبعد كده الادفنتيشن. هنا هو برضه الليرز اهو اللي هي الايه الثلاثه هنا قدام وهنا خمسه. طب ايه اهميه ان انا اعرف الدبس اوف التيومر انفيجن؟ لو التيومر كونفايند للميكوزا والسب ميكوزا نوت انفيدنج للكارتج يبقى ده ايرلي لان كانسر. يبقى العيان ده ممكن حتى في بعض الاحيان تعالجه باندسكوبيك لكن لو لقيت ان التيومر انفيدنج الكارتج يبقى معناه دي فيه انفلتريشن يبقى معناه ده انفيدنج الكانسر ففي انترا كارتليجنس وفي اكسترا كارتليجنس انفيجن اكسترا كارتليجنس معناه ان هو حاصل انفيجن فمهم جدا ان انت تعرف الدبس او التيومر انفيجن ودي ممكن في الفيوتشر لو انت بتجيب حالات لان كانسر في البدري ممكن تعمل حتى اندسكوبيك طبعا مفيش حد متفق عليها 100% ان ممكن تعمل اندسكوبيك مانجمنت لو لقيت ان الكارتج نوت انفيدنج وده ممكن عن طريق الصناعه تاني حاجة ممكن تعملها ان انت تقدر تشوف الليف نود ده عن طريق الريديال بروب يمكن دي حالة من الرسالة بتاعتي ده حالة عن طريق الريديال بروب بتاع الالترا ساوند طبعا الكونفكس اللي انت شفته دلوقتي هو الافضل طبعا ده كان فلاصل بالنسبة للي بيعمل ده الرايتين برونكس وده الليف نود وده البلمونري ارتري تقدر تجيب الميداستاين او الهاي الليف نود عن طريق الريديال بروب لكن دلوقتي طبعا بقى اوبسوليت محدش بيستخدمه لان الكونفكس هو الافضل لان ريد تايم ده كان اسيستد تايم تاني حاجة ان انت ممكن تجيب تيومرز ودي برضه حالة من وجوزتا برضه اشتغلناها ان انت بتجيب ده عنده تيومر في الميدستايلن وان انت تقدر تجيب في التيومر وتقدر عن طريق ال... تقدر عن طريق الايجوز تعمل كل ده عن طريق الريديال برو. لكن اهم حاجة وهي بقى التراكت اللي بتستخدم دلوقتي في الريديال برو اللي احنا بنستخدمه في حاجتين يا اما الدبس اوف تيومر انفيجن او البريفرال ريفيوز ان انت تشوف اللانك بارينكيما وهنتكلم عليها بالتفاصيل يبقى دي الانديكيشنز بعد كده هو الكونفكس بروف طبعا اللي هو اللي احنا بنتكلم عليه في اول ما جينا اللي هو بتشوف بيه الهايلر والميدستاين الليف نودز وبرضه بتشوف الميدستاين التيومرز بتعمل ستيجنج اول مره او بتعمل ري ستيجنج للعيان في مرحله ثانيه من العلاج تبتدي تشوف بقى زي ما الدكتور حسن وريكو حكايه اهو زي ما انتم شايفين هنا الاورطه والبرنامج الارضي واجب بتاع العلامه الخضراء يا دكتور اهي انت لو تشوف الصوره هي دي اللي بتحدد لك دي بقى في الحقيقه لما تشوفها في السي تي في السجن هتلاقي ان الاورطه فوق والبرنامج الارضي لان هي دي العلامه اللي فوق فانت لو قلبت الصوره هتلاقي اللي فوق واخد بالك؟ لو قلبت الصوره 
هتلاقيها حقيقي زي زي السيتين ما تبقى سالفه لان هي دي الحته الخضراء دي بتاعت اللي فوق استنى اللي فوق وهنا اهوت برضه بتقدر تشوف اللي تدخل اليمين وتاخد البوابس هي دي الانديكيشنز اللي احنا بنستخدمها هنبتدي نتكلم بقى على واحد واحد من الريديال برو الريديال برو ده بيعمل ريديال سكاني بيورينا 360 درجه عندنا حاجه اسمها المينيتشر ريديال بروبس المينيتشر ريديال بروبس دي السايز بتاعها 2.5 ملم في منها 20 و30 ميجا هرتز المستخدم اكتر هو ال 20 عيبه بقى هي دي بتستخدم بتركب ده ده الالترا ساوند بروب بيتركب عليه بيبقى مونتد عليه بالون كاتيتر بتبقى على الكيت بتاعته الكاتيتر دي ممكن بعد كده بنملاها بالميه عشان تعمل انترفيس عشان الهواء ما يضايقناش وبندخلها عن طريق الوركنج شانل بتاع المنظار وبعد كده بننفخ البالون كاتيتر دي هي هي دي عشان تقدر تستخدمها لازم تستخدم منظار الوركنج شانل بتاعته 2.8 لان هي 2.5 فلازم تستخدم منظار ريلاتيفلي كبير عشان تعمل الريديال بروب الترا ساوند دي اللي بيسموها مينيتشر ريديال بروب ودي يمكن اللي انا كنت بشتغل بيها زمان في 2002 لكن اللي بقى دلوقتي دي طبعا السيستم اللي احنا بنستخدمه طبعا اتطور وكل حاجه اهم حاجه يبقى فيه الاندوسكوبيك يونت ودي الحته اللي هي بيبقى فيها البروب والبالونه موجوده وهذه السرنج عشان تنفخ البالونه ودي ديستنت اند قبل ما ينتفخ وبعد ما عدى المنظار ينتفخ هي دي اللي هي المينيتشر ريديال بروب دلوقتي في حاجات اسهل بقى اللي هي بايه؟ الترا مينيتشر ريجل برو زي ما انتم شايفين السايز بتاعها 1.4 او 1.7 حجمها صغير جدا ما بتحتاجش بقى هنا عكس الثانيه ما بتحتاجش بالونه بتركبها على طول وتدخلها من 20 و30 البوبيلر منها 20 ومتدخلها في منصار صغير الوركنج شانل بتاعته 2 ملم وده كويس لان انت عاوز توصل البريفري بتاعت الباب لان كده الثانيه دي المنظار كان بيبقى 2 و8 من 10 فما بتقدرش توصل للبريفري وانت اصلا داخل عشان تصور تدور على بريفري بالمونري ريديوز فلازم ان انت تخش بنظام صغير عشان تقدر توصل مور بريفرنت بالبروب بتاع السونار. وهو ده السيستم بتاعها غير الثاني المعقد اللي انت بتدخل اللي هي الريتش دي كده وبعد كده بتطلع من المنظار بتدخلها بقى في الوركنج شانل من المنظار وتدخلها من غير بالونه خالص وتزقها وتبتدي تشوف بتشوف السونار بيتش. هي الفكره بالظبط كده عباره عن ادي هو المنظار وادي البروب بتدخل المنظار وبعدين عندك الليجن بتطلع السونار بروب بتخش تتحرك تشغل السونار يعمل لك ريديال ايمج 360 درجه يوريك الليجن اللي موجود. فهنقول انت بقى طيب ازاي هتاخد البايوبسي؟ فانت انت هتاخد ان انت هتاخد البايوبسي ان انت بتستخدم فيه حاجات ان هو تعمل اكستندنج للويستن شانل لان انت بتستخدم حاجات مساعده اللي هي جايد تشيز. تستخدم فيه حاجه زي الانبوبه كده وفي الفورسبس وفي البراش. وفي حاجه بعد كده هوريها لكم اللي هي الكلام. الجايد تشيز دي ظريفه جدا ان انت الاول بتدخل المنظار وتدخل الريديال بروب والجايد تشيز. بعد ما تمشي بالمنظار وتجيب التيومر وتشوفه في الصوره بتشوف الصوره بتاعت السونار بتسحب الريديال بروب بتاع السونار وتدخل بقى حسب الليجن ممكن تدخل الفورسبس او تدخل البراش وتشتغل يبقى انت كده هو الجايد تشيز ده عباره عن زي تلسكوب تلسكوب او اكستندد وركنج شانل يعني انت طولت القناه بتاعت العمل بتاعت المنظار بيعمل اكستندد وركنج شانل انتيريلي وضمنت ان انت في نفس المكان ان انت اول ما لاحظتها بالسونار شديت البروب عملت ريتريفر للسونار بروب ودخلت بعد كده اي بايوبسي هتاخدها سواء هتاخد بالفورسبس او هتاخد بالبراش. طب في مشكله ساعات ان انت تخش بالمنظار وده اخرك في المنظار تيجي تيجي تدكك الفورسبس اللي انت او البروب ما تعرفش تخش كل ما تدككه ثاني حاجه هنا في الحته دي مش هتقدر ان انت ايه تقدر تلف المنظار لان يعني المنظار هنا في ايه كده. ففي حاجه اسمها الكيورات دبل هنج الكيورات دي عباره عن حاجه ليها تو انجلز تقدر تساعدك في الحته دي فانت بتدخل الكيورات الاول قبل ما تدخل البروب بتخش على جنب كده اهوت عشان تقدر تعمل لها ليفنج مره تدخلها كده وممكن تدخلها بالعكس لو عاوز تخش في حته ثانيه وبعد كده اهوت تدك تدك بعد ما تدخل الفيرات بتدك عليها الجايد تشيز اللي احنا شفناه وبعد ما تدك الجايد تشيز تدك بعد كده اهوت يمكن اهوت في كل فيديو بعد شويه بعد كده بعد ما تدك الجايد تشيز تطلع طبعا الفيرات وتدك الجايد تشيز تدك السونار وبعد كده الفوز فالطاقه اللي هي الفيرات دي برضه هتبقى ظريفه ان انت في السايد ويز ان انت تقدر تعمل القصه دي طيب ايه اللي احنا بنشوفه في الريديال بروب سونار لما بنخش زي ما الدكتور حسن قال لكم السنو ستورم ابييرنس ان هي اللانج بتابير زي السنو ستورم واول ما بتلاقي ده تعرف ان انت في النورمال لانج تيشو زي السنو ستورم زي عاصفه بتختلف طيب التيومر بيبان ازاي؟ التيومر الحقيقه فيري بيكيوليور ان انت بتلاقي دارك اريا وفي برايت بوردرز موجوده ودي اشكال مختلفه زي ما انتم شايفين ادي اهو التيومر اهو وفي دارك بوردرز اهو وهي دي نفس الصوره وهنا هو ده ده التيومر وده اللانج فاريكيما وزي ما انتم شايفين البوردر موجوده فدي بتبقى سهله هنا الستورم ستورم ابييرنس وبعد كده هي دارك التيومر بيبان 
قالوا له لا وليها برايت جو ده بالنسبه للايه للتشين طيب الانكلامات الكليشن اللي ليها كاركترستيك اه ليها كوفي بريك اه انت هتكمل بعد الكوفي بريك يعني احنا عندنا اه بعد الكوفي بريك هتكمل تاني المحاضره يعني الكوفي بريك بتاعنا المفروض خلينا نقول نص ساعه بقى كويس عشان يعني هو لازم كوفي بريك كله في نفس الوقت؟ لا 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 مش لازم بس عشان بس يعني ايه؟ حاضر ما يزهقوا من الكوفي بريك زي ما انت هتكمل المحاضرات بعد ال طبعا طبعا ثانك يو ما تزهقوا قولوا يعني احنا ممكن نخلص دي وبعد كده ناخد الكوفي بريك ما ناخدش اللي بعده الانفلامات الليجن بتبقى ايه هوموجينيوس بيبقى هتلاقي حاجه ارياز فيها هايبر ترانسلوسنسي وهايبر ترانسلوسنسي اهم حاجه ان انت بتلاقي فيها وايت سبوتس والوايت سبوتس دي عباره عن اير برونكوجرام عباره عن هواء موجود جوه البرونكاي وده الايكو بتاعه فبتلاقي اير برونكوجرام بيبان زي وايت سبوتس فبتلاقي هيموجينيستي عباره عن انا احب اسهل للناس وفي الشرح حتت نقط كده هتلاقي حتت سوداء ونقط بيضاء فيها تبقى انت عارف ان دي انكلامات الفيجن وفيها هيدروجينيستي في الاكل بس بعض الاحيان لو لقيت كده لما جبت الشنب تلاقي حتت دارك دي لو في حتت كونتروتيك وحصل بريكنج داون فتلاقي حتت سوداء في النص كمان لو تلاقي بريكنج داون لكن هي بالبلدي كده هتلاقي حتت سوداء وفي زي زي ريدج حواليها ابيض يبقى انت ده في تيومر حتت منقطه وفي حتت فيها هيموجينيستي يبقى انت في انفلاماتري في حتت سوداء بلد فيها صغيره يبقى دي فيها اريا اوف انكروس. بتدخل الالتر ساوند بروب ادي التيومر بتفضل تحرك الابره يمين وشمال لغايه ما توصل لغايه التيومر تبتدي يبان لك اهو ادي اهو الريدج اللي بتاعه الحته السوداء طبعا في ناس بتشتغل ممكن تشتغلها من غير الفلوروسكوبي ممكن تشتغلها بالفلوروسكوبي بالفلوروسكوبي طبعا هتساعدك ان انت بعد ما تعمل كونفرميشن اللي انت شفته في السونار بالفلوروسكوبي وبعد كده تاخد البيوكسي زي ما انت قلت لكم ممكن تستخدم الدايت شيز. ممكن تبقى الليجن باين في الفلوروسكوبي زي في الحاله دي باين اهو في السونار اهو في السونار وباين في الفلوروسكوبي وممكن ان انت الفلوروسكوبي في ناس بتشتغل من غير فلوروسكوبي الليجن مش باين اصلا في الفلوروسكوبي باين اهو في السي تي وباين ان هو في الالترا سان فممكن كده وممكن كده. ده بالنسبة للراديان بروب، نيجي للكونفكس بروب، الكونفكس بروب زي ما انتم شايفين هو عبارة عن منظار بس المنظار في الديستال اند بتاعته فيه سونار، ده الفرق الوحيد اللي بين المنظار العادي، طبعا المنظار ده هو ده بيبقى بيتركب في السيستم او الريتم سيستم، أهم حاجة إن إحنا عندنا الورك إن الوركينج شانل بتاعته هنا هو ده الوركينج شانل، الوركينج شانل هتلاقي الإبرة بتطلع بقلب ال 20 درجة، يعني القلب دي 20 درجة عشان هوريكم ليه عشان تخش في الليجن اللي أنت هتشوفها في السونار تاني حاجه الاوبتكس ادي الاوبتكس اهو بتاعت المنظار دي اللي هتشوف بيها البرونكوسكوبيك فيو ودي الالترا ساوند بروب والالترا ساوند بروب ممكن تتركب عليها هنا هو زي ممكن تركب عليها بالون كاتيتر عشان تنفخها وفي ناس بتشتغل حتى من غير ما تنفخ البالونه ادي هو ايه والبالونه منفوخه بالشكل ده كده ده السيستم بقى في واحد سيستم بتاع فوجي اهو ده السيستم بتاع اولمبس هنا هو ده الفار اللي موجود ده في بقى زراير طبعا يعني مش هنوريها دلوقتي ما لهاش دعوه تبقى في الهاندز اون بعد كده مره ثانيه. مهم جدا ان انت تعرف ان الايجو سكوب بيبقى ستيفر واجمد من المنصوره يمكن الواحد اول ما جاي يشتغل بال 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 بالايجو تي بي ان ايه اللي هو الكونفكس بروب بتلاقي ايدك بتوجعك لان هو اتقل بكثير من الثاني، ثاني حاجه المانيبيليشن ساعات عشان انت بتشتغل عن طريق الرنجيال ماسك احنا بنشتغل ساعات بنشتغل الشغل بتاعنا الرنجيال ماسك فبتلاقي ان انت بتلاقي فيه صعوبه وتحس ان ايدك بتوجعك بعد المنظار وهو اتقل وبتحتاج ان انت تدكك بايدك شويه فدي نقطه بتبقى مهمه. تاني حاجه ان انت لازم يبقى عندك سيمالتينيوس فيو ان انت تشوف الاثنين مع بعض طبعا هو المفروض بيديك سايد تشين في الاجهزه بيديك زي صوره صغيره في في الكورنر كده دي لكن الافضل ان انت تحط صورتين جنب بعض عشان تقدر تشوف لو انت بتعمل مانيبيليشن مش تفضل تغير من الصوره الصغيره وتكبر دي هيبقى افضل لو عندك الصورتين مع بعض خصوصا بتوع بنتكس عندهم الجهازين اتس ماسك ان لازم يبقوا الاثنين جنب بعض عكس الاولمبس بيبقى في سب سكرين صغير كده زي ما الدكتور حسن وريكم القصه دي. آه الاوبتيكال فيو ان هو زي برضه الدكتور حسن وريها لكم ان انت المنظار الانجل بتاعته اللي بتشوف بيها انجل 30 فعشان تقدر تشوف دغري لازم ترجع المنظار لورا عشان تشوف تحت. يعني المنظار عشان كده لما بتيجي تشتغل وتعمل انتيبيشن زي ما شفتوا من الفوكال كورتس لازم ان انت ترجع الانجل بتاعت المنظار لورا عشان تشوف تحت لان هو انجل زاويه زي 30 وزمان لما كنا بنشتغل الريجيد بروكوسكوب عشان نجيب الابر لوب لازم نستخدم اللينس اللي هي الانجل 30 لكن دلوقتي طبعا ما حدش بيستخدم بعد ما طلع الفايبر اوبتيك خلاص انت بتشتغل كده وبعد كده بتستخدم لينس زيرو وبعد كده هو بتخش بالفلكس بروكوسكوب فالنقطه الرئيسيه ان انت تعرف ان الفيو دي مهمه جدا طب ايه اهميه القصه دي؟ 
ان انت ممكن زي ما الدكتور حسن قال لكم ان انت ممكن تعور الفوكال كوردز انت شايف الفوكال كورد قدامك تيجي تخش تربطي تخش تربطي القصه كلها اول ما تشوف الفوكال كورد ترجع المنظار ورا وتبقى شايف الحته الانتيري كوميشن وتخش رغم ان ده مش ده الطبيعي لكن هو ده الموقف تاني حاجه ان انت وانت بتشتغل تلاقي في الاول تلاقي ان انت عمال تلطش في الايرويز بتخبط فيها لا القصه كلها ان انت لازم ترجع المنظار لورا طول ما انت مرجع المنظار لورا يبقى انت بتشوف انجل زيرو عشان تلغي الانجل اللي هي 30 دي طبعا السكاني بيبقى بارلل للانسيرشن تو ذا انسيرشن دايركشن ادي اهو ادي ادي البرو وادي هو اللي الحته دي اللي بتبقى سكاني بتبقى بارلل للايه للاترا ساوند بروب اللي موجود في امبيدد في البرونكوسكوب طبعا الانجل بتاعت السولار بتدي ايمج انجل 50 بتاعت السولار دي انجل 50 والانجل بتاعت المنظار هنا 30 وهقول لكم الفرق ما بين الشركات دلوقتي الدايركت لازم يبقى في دايركت كونتاكت مع البرونكي وول لازم تلزق المنظار في البرونكي وول لو في حته مش لازق هتلاقي ارتفاكتس وهيوريها لكم الدكتور حسن اكيد في الترابل شوتنج ان انت الحكايه لا مهم جدا تلزق خصوصا لو بتطلع الكاثيتر ساعات وانت بتطلع الكاثيتر تلاقي ان انت وانت بتدخله بتلاقي شويه ارتفاكتس لان انت لما بتطلع الكاثيتر ساعات المنظار بيرجع منك شويه ورا فتقوم زاقق المنظار تاني عشان تقدر ان انت ما تحصلش الارتفاك عشان تبقى اهم حاجه ان انت تعمل دايركت كونتاكت طبعا في دوبلر ابيلتي آه ناس كتيره جدا بتحب ان انت الاول تخش بالمنظار الفايبر اوبتيك العادي تعمل سكاننج لان انت المانيبيليشن بالكونفكس بروب هو كبير فما تيجي تتحرك بيه مش هتقدر تعرف تاني حاجه ان انت تشوف كويس وتاني حاجه الناس اللي بتشتغل المنظار ده باللوكال ان انت تدي الاناسيزيا كلها بالمنظار الفايبر اوبتيك العادي وبعد كده تشتغل بالريجن الناس اللي هم بتشتغل لوكال الناس طبعا بتشتغل جنرال هتستخدم الفايبر اوبتيك عشان تقدر تعمل آه اليوجر بروفسكوب العادي آه بعد كده دي مهم جدا بقى القصه دي ان احنا عندنا الديستال اند بتاعت المنظار ده الاول انا بتكلم بنتكس اوليمبس بنتكس فوج الحته اللي هي الديستال اند بتاع المنظار في بنتكس في اوليمبس 6.9 في بنتكس 6.2 في فوجي 6.7 ودي لو نيجي نقارنها باي منظار في اوبتيك تبقى حته كبيره جدا عشان كده المنظار بقى نيفر ان انت تشتغل من النوز في ناس كتير بتشتغل في اوبتيك من النوز وفي ناس بتشتغل من الماوس نيفر ان حتى يشتغل ال 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 الكونفكس بروب الترا ساوند من النوز ليه؟ لان الديس الاند كبيره وكل شركه ليها الديس الاند مختلفه. الشانل اللي بيطلع منها الحروب بتاعت النيدل دي بتبقى 2 ملم ودي بتبقى على قلب 20 عشان لما تشوف السونار كده هو تخش تخش فين؟ مع الايه؟ تبقى اوبليك فورورد مع صوره السونار. ليه مش عاملينها انجل عاديه؟ لو انجل عاديه هتطلع الابره هتبقى فين؟ تبقى الابرة بارل للتيوب فهم عاملين الابرة الان 20 عشان لما تطلع تخش في الصورة بتاعت السونار. تاني حاجة الفايبر اوبتيك فيجوال انجل هنا هو في الانجل المنظار نفسه بتشوف منه. الانجل بتاعت الاوليمبس 35 بتاعت البيرتكس 45 بتاعت الفوجي بتبقى 10 فورورد اوبليك. فالحتة اللي هي باللزق دي دي الاندوسكوبيك فيو اللي هي بتشوفها بالمنظار. الحتة اللي السودا دي الالترا ساوند فيو. يبقى المنظار هيوريك الحته دي الحته دي هي كانت 35 عشان كده اللي هي الانجل ال 30 بقول لكم ان انتوا ترجعوا المنظار لان انت ما بتشوفش دغري تاني حاجه ان المساحه دي كلها بتشوف فيو 80 بتشوف فيو 80 بال 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 اللي هو الفيجوال فيو هنا بيبقى 80 في الاوليمبس بيبقى 100 في البنتكس 120 في الفيوجي فعشان كده الفيوجي دلوقتي هو افضل واحد كصوره مش عشان هم يعني ما يعني فوجي لكن هو الصوره بتاعته بتديك صوره كبيره لان 120 المساحه دي بتبقى 120 ثاني حاجه الانجل اللي انت طالع بيها 10 طبعا مش زي ال 30 وال 45 اللي انت بتبقى مشكله بالنسبه لك طبعا الهرتز بتاعت الفريكونسي 7.5 بتبقى كويسه جدا عشان تقدر تجيب بيها الالترا ساوند اللي هي عشان يدينا الالترا ساوند الانجل بتاعته بتاعت السكاني انجل 50 75 75 في الشركات ما بتفرقش كتير هو اللي بيفرق بينهم اللي هو الاندوسكوبيك او او الفايبر اوبتيك فيو اللي هو الاوبتيك فيو هو ده اللي بيهمنا جدا لان هو ده اللي بيخلي بيخلي المانيبيليشن ايزي لو كان كل ما يظهر الانجل بتاعت الانتظار اللي هي زيرو دي بتخلي المانيبيليشن ايزي وكل ما الفيلد بتاعك بتاع الفيو بيكبر كل ما بتبقى المانيبيليشن كبرونكوسكوبيك بيبقى افضل فعشان كده هتلاقي الاصغر والاكبر حاجه هم الفوجي يمكن دلوقتي احسن حاجه طبعا كلهم فيهم الدوبلر ما فيش ولا واحد في الثلاث شركات فيهم الدوبلر تاني حاجة الجيج ممكن تستخدم من ال 21 او 22 الاثنين بيخشوا في الوركينج شانل. 
طبعا ان هو ان البندنج لو من غير النيدل بتلاقي ان في بندنج كويس لكن لو حطيت النيدل البندنج بيبقى اقل شويه عشان كده ان انت ما تقدرش تخش مور ديستال آه بالمنظار تاني حاجه عشان حجم المنظار كبير تاني حاجه النيدل لما بتبقى جوه المنظار بتخلي البندنج آه اصعب يمكن الدكتور حسن كان بيقول ان في دلوقتي نيدلز لسه يعني جديده نازله هتخلي تساعد في حكايه البندنج دي اكتر هتبقى مور سوفت هتساعد هنشوفها بقى اكبر لما تنزل زي ما قال لكم برضه الدكتور حسن في الاول ان انت لما تيجي تخش في قلب ال 30 فبتزق المنظار لورا بترجعه وترفع الليفر لفوق عشان المنظار يرجع لورا فتخش عند الكوميشن دي وتبتدي تخش بالمنظار وانت شغال في الترقيه بتنفخ البالونه شويه حته صغيره من البالونه عشان بعد كده تقدر تعمل دايركت كونتاكت لو عاوز تيجي ليش المعاينه بتنفخ البالونه على الاخر وتلزق في الهول وتبتدي تشوف الايه الليفر وبعد ما تشوف الليفر وتبتدي تبص البالونه ويبتدي تطلع الشيس، مهم جدا ان انت تطلع الشيس وما تطلعش النيدل. يعني مهم جدا النيدل عشان تطلع ما ينفعش تطلع النيدل من غير ما تطلع الشيس. لان يعني انت لو طلعت النيدل من غير ما تطلع الشيس ممكن تعمل فولت سبيشال وتبوظ المنظار والمنظار يبوظ منك، فالاول بتطلع الشيس وبتطلع حته صغيره بس من الشيس وبعد كده دوت بتلزق المنظار وتعمل دايركت كونتاكت في الهول وما تعمل دايركت كونتاكت وانت كنت اوريدي قبلها عامل عامل اتوميك فيو تبتدي تطلع النيدل، اول ما تطلع النيدل هنا هو هتبص هتلاقي ان في ارتفاعات تبتدي بقى الواحد وهو بيتعلم في الاول يتضايق جدا يلاقي الصوره بقى. انا عمال حضرت صوره السونار وظبطت اجي اعمل هنا اهو السونار ما بقاش هي القصه كلها ان انت اول ما زقيت النيدل المنظار رجع لورا فالحل ان انت تزق المنظار بعد ما تدخل النيدل تزق المنظار معاك تزق المنظار تاني لجوه عشان تقدر ايه تعمل جود كونتاكت والارتفاعات دي تروح وهنا بقى بعد كده بتطلع النيدل وتعمل توق فوق فوق من 10 ل 20 مره بس حد عنده اي سؤال انا انا بصص على ايه انا المنظار اللي ورا ولا انا بصص ليه شو بده يجي سو ويلكم باك افتر كفرينج ذا اناتومي اند ذا اكويبمنت وي غانا موف تو كفر ا فيو توبكس ريليتد تو ايفاس يوز نيدلز ذا روز رابيد اون سايد examination and elastography. Um, so the needles, uh, you've got the uh, 22 gauge needle, which most of the studies uh, were done using this needle. This is the uh, smallest needle, it's a cytology needle. And then uh, after that, the 21 uh, gauge needle was developed and very recently there's uh, a new 19 gauge needle that was launched. There's also the Procore that's been around for a while and uh, there's a prototype uh, about the needle forceps that I've never seen um, actually uh, uh, produced or launched, but there's uh, studies on it. So uh, when the 22 gauge needle um, came out, there was uh, uh, excitement that it would give us uh, bigger samples. However, when uh, a couple of studies came out that uh, showed that it's maybe not, uh, there's one randomized controlled trial, relatively small, with 60 participants, comparing the 21 versus 22, and showed a similar diagnostic yield. So the overall diagnostic yield was about 70% uh, with both the 21 and the 22 uh, gauge needle. Uh, and there was no difference in the adequacy of the histologic samples, uh, which also was about 78%. But the study was uh, criticized that it was probably small to detect the difference. The, uh, and then there's a, uh, a retrospective study that uh, used the ACQUIRE registry. The ACQUIRE registry is a big registry that many centers uh, contribute their cases and that, that they document the, the procedure and outcomes. So using uh, this uh, res registry uh, with an analysis of uh, 1,299 patient, uh, comparing 21 and 22, there was also no difference uh, in the outcome. Uh, so uh, why bigger is uh, not better? Because sometimes it's harder actually to puncture um, with, the, uh, with a bigger needle. It makes a big difference. Even a, a small difference in size makes it harder uh, to uh, puncture. Um, the needle is bigger and stiffer. Um, and uh, maybe that's what's uh, impacting. However, more recently, um, there's the uh, new uh, one of the companies, Olympus, came out with the uh, uh, Shop 2 uh, that have sharper uh, edge and uh, more flexible. So uh, as Dr. Ashraf showed you that although the uh, scope can bend more, but once you put the uh, needle in it, uh, this 
angle is reduced. So now we have uh, a newer needle that allow the bronchoscope to uh, bend uh, to about 85 degrees, uh, which is a significant advantage when you're trying to oppose yourself against the wall. So what, what you experience sometimes is you do your ultrasound, you see the lymph node, everything's great. Now you put your needle in and you wanna try to reproduce the same image and you can't. Uh, now you can't have the uh, scope all the way against the wall. So this uh, ability to flex the scope with the needle inside to a bigger degree uh, will give you a bigger advantage and make life much easier for you. So with this uh, 19 gauge needle, uh, they were able, also able to have, so the inside, what matters is the inside of the needle. So they were able to create a needle with a thinner wall so the inside is, uh, is bigger, but the needle is still the same size. It's still as big as the 22 needle. Okay, and it's more flexible at the same time. So how does it perform? It's recently um, launched, so we don't have really much uh, studies uh, out there. Uh, this was just presented last year in the chest, uh, and it's just a simple study ex vivo. So they just got pieces of liver and, uh, uh, and heart, and they punctured with the 19 versus the uh, 22, and they showed that you can actually get bigger tissue. So not really the, the good level of evidence that show you that this needle will, will, will do better. And um, another uh, study from Canada, also uh, published uh, still only as an abstract, so not in the literature, uh, uh, compare, uh, it's a case series only using 40 patients, and they asked basically the physician their opinion about it. So it's not real clinical outcome. So the physician seemed to like this needle, the, the uh, 19 needle, and uh, it shows that they were able so number one, although it's, uh, it's a bigger gauge, they were able to access uh, all the site uh, more easily. So they have 41% uh, said it's average, so it's similar to uh, the previous needle, and 40% said it's, uh, you know, it's easy. So kind of better than the, the previous needle. So in the majority of cases, about more than 90% of the cases, they were able to access all the station they want with this bigger needle. And uh, re with regards to the performance, uh, so the pathologic performance, uh, they were able to uh, have a better yield in 55% of the cases and similar uh, yield in about 25%. But the yield was worse in about 17%. Okay, so that's what we have. Uh, there was only uh, one published single center study on this needle also, um, and uh, that's from Poland. Um, and here they have a case, only case series, so there's no co comparison. They just saw you knew what they, uh, they published their experience with 22 cases um, and showed that they actually were able to get uh, a result in all of them. Uh, so they had 100% uh, basically yield. Uh, they were able to diagnose uh, four cases of sarcoidosis, 100%, usually the yield is in the 60%. Uh, so that's the advantage here. Uh, reactive lymph node, you're always worried about it and you're always suspecting maybe I missed the, the cancer, but if you see plenty of lymphocytes uh, and they're not atypical, then you're more uh, comfortable, but you're always worried that it may be lymphoma. And lung cancer is usually the easiest, your yield is usually 90%. So here uh, they were able to get 100%. Uh, and the cell block was also adequate uh, in 86% of the cases. So it's promising, uh, but these are really very preliminary data, and I'm sure we're going to have much more coming up soon. The Procore needle is, a, is another needle by Cook, uh, and the difference with it uh, is the bevel. So it's a small, it's a 22 gauge, but they have a, a beveled side here. So here it functions like a cytology needle, a regular cytology needle, but on the way out, uh, you can angle, and there's a specific technique to use. You can uh, angle your needle uh, inside the, uh, so when, when you puncture at a specific angle, then what you do is you relax your scope so that the needle changes the, uh, the, the, the angle, and then you pull it so that you get some, uh, some tissue out on your way. So you, sometimes you can get a small core. Uh, it's a very small core. The pathologists sometimes like it, sometimes the, uh, don't. Uh, that's my personal experience, and uh, the published uh, data is, uh, doesn't show an advantage. But every time I have a suspected lymphoma, that's when I use it. Uh, and uh, sometimes we're lucky we can get uh, a piece 
uh, and then when we get the piece, we'll treat it uh, informally, sim you know, similar to a core. But uh, most of the time, uh, you still need the cytology part. You know, if you want to get your flow cytometry, uh, because what they, what they need the cells, and they don't want it to be very bloody, because otherwise you're, you're getting burned from blood. So the, the, the really the, the choice of the needle is tricky depending on the situation. Sometimes you want cytology, sometimes you want uh, an actual core. It's not always advantageous to have cores because the sample may become bloodier uh, and uh, you, you don't want that. Uh, this is just an image of the prototype that the, the, I'm aware of only a publication about it. I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know anyone who uses it. Uh, before this came up, there was uh, also one study where uh, they actually used a pediatric forceps. So what they did, they started with the uh, needle, so they do their puncture, they go to the lymph node, uh, they want a sample, they do, they puncture the pleura, uh, sorry, the, the, the bronchial wall with the needle, and then they introduce uh, a separate, after they remove it, they introduce a separate uh, forceps, a mini forceps, a pediatric forceps, through this wall. It's very, I tried it, it's very hard to do, and there's a risk that you can damage your scope, because this, uh, the, the forceps is not covered by the sheet, so you're introducing the metal uh, inside it, and it's not really um, uh, designed to. So when they come up, they develop this so-called needle forceps. So it's a, it's a bevel tip, so if you can see, it's quite sharp here at the tip. That's like a needle, but when it goes, uh, the side of it can open, okay? And it has a, a sheet to cover it, so you don't damage your scope. Um, and uh, so after you puncture your, uh, the wall, you need the beveled uh, tip to uh, get to the wall. You open the forceps inside the uh, lymph node and you get your samples. So how did it do? There's only uh, one pilot study that I'm aware of, of 50 patients. They were able to penetrate the wall in the majority, 96%, that's uh, already something. And they were able to get adequate material in 90%. And the diagnosis was established in 86%. And there was no complication. So it seemed promising, but I, I, I can't get why it, you know, it wasn't really commercialized. Um, so I asked Olympus a few times about it. I know it was developed by Olympus, and uh, most of the study were uh, you know, by their partner in Germany. Uh, this is the image of the uh, needle, actually, and you can see the forceps uh, open inside in the uh, lymph nodes. So I'll move to discuss now rapid on-site uh, specimen examination. Basically what it entails is that a pathologist will be present in the room with you while you're taking your samples. So you take your samples and uh, you use the diff quick, uh, so you, you air dry it, okay? So unlike the typical samples where you don't want it to dry, you want to smear it uh, and, and usually right away while it's still wet, fix it in, in alcohol. Here you want it to dry, to air dry, so you put a small quantity, you air dry it, and you put the diff quick stain, uh, unlike the uh, other stain, the BAPS, uh, Papa Nicolau stain, that's used in the usual samples, you use a quick diff uh, stain, and then the pathologist will look at it on site. And what they tell you, they don't give you a diagnosis, but they tell you if it's adequate or not. So what does it mean to be adequate? They look at cellularity, if there's cells, lymphocytes, or malignant cells. Okay, so if you have a lot of lymphocytes, for them it's adequate. If you have uh, a malignant cell, of course it's uh, diagnostic. How uh, does it do? It's considered actually the gold standard, um, but again, it requires the uh, presence of uh, uh, cytologists on site. So, a uh, retrospective study that included for about 400 patients with cancer, suspected or confirmed, doing staging. They used this techniques, and there was 94% concordance with the final. Uh, pathology. So if they said it's adequate, then it's adequate in 94% of the cases. A few times they missed, but there was really no false positive. So they, were ne they never said, you know, it's, it's adequate and turn out to be inadequate. But sometimes they say it's inadequate and it turn out to be adequate. So that's where they missed. Um, and so there's a 6% false positive where they say it's inadequate and then on the psychology it's positive. So how does it impact? Why would you use it? Um, Again, another study, uh, just 100 patients, not big, and uh, they showed that what actually happens is that decrease the need for additional procedures. So once you're doing your bronchoscopy um, and you're doing your uh, sampling, you, you're more confident 
of the diagnosis. So you don't end up maybe bypass, going trying to biopsy the main lesion um, or doing uh, brushing or doing biopsy of the tr primary tumors or go to different lymph nodes. So say you go, you get to the highest stage lymph node, say you have multiple lymph nodes and you have a lesion. Uh, if you have the rows on site, you biopsy the N3 lesion, which is the N3 lymph nodes, and they tell you you're good, so you're probably satisfied. Okay, and you stop your procedure. So, but does it actually um, uh, help with the number of aspiration? Yes, you do less aspiration. So on average, you do two aspiration versus the usual three or more aspiration that you would do if you didn't have rows. But does it translate into a shorter procedure time? Not really. So when they compare the time, which what we care turned out to be 22 versus uh, minutes versus uh, 22 minutes, and the sensitivity didn't change, <laughs> and the accuracy didn't change. So it didn't impact the overall outcome. It makes you more comfortable, you do less procedures inside, but overall, you're not spending less time uh, in your procedure, and it's not improving your yield overall. And that was our experience. I mean, when we started first, we used to use pros. So we used to send every uh, slide, we used to send the slide to the pathologist. The, our cytologist wouldn't agreed to come up. So actually had someone run down, show them the, uh, the result. We suggest air dry it, they will stain it down, and they will call us back and tell us if it's adequate or inadequate. And then with time, when we were, became very comf confident and comfortable and our yields was quite high, we stopped doing it. Uh, um, so is it cost effective? They think it is, except if you don't account for the cost of the cytologist. So if, if you're in an institution where the cytologist is already paid for, then it's cost effective. If it is already uh, salaried and they have time on their hand, then it's cost effective. But if there's an extra charge for the cytologist, uh, you know, then it's not. Or you, you're using some of his time or her time uh, from other things, then it's not cost effective. Uh, so again, there's a, uh, here you use less material, you use less slides, but it's not very expensive. Uh, so it depends what's more expensive, the time of the cytologist or the numbers of slides and the number of biopsy if you're gonna use forceps. So every, every model is different. Um, and uh, so there, there's quite a bit of uh, reduction in the cytotechnician time, cytopathologist, um, but uh, overall, the guidelines don't uh, recommend it, okay? Because of the um, questionable benefits, um, it's thought to be not supported by firm evidence, although it's considered the gold standard. Uh, and uh, experts still recommend it. So they still think it's the gold standard, but when the guidelines review the evidence, there's no good evidence for it. Um, and uh, there may be some uh, influence to the pathologist. So if you get something that you're not suspected, maybe you're gonna do molecular testing or maybe you're gonna do culture or flow cytometry. So say, say you get all, you're suspecting cancer and you, all you get is lymphocytes, you say, oh, maybe it's a lymphoma. Let me send one, uh, uh, sample just for flow cytometry. For that, it, you, can't, you can't do it afterwards. For the flow cytometry, you have to have your solution. You have to actually flush the whole sample with the solution. So you handle it differently. You get your sample, you get the uh, flow cytometry solution and you flush it all the way in the special tube. Um, if you say, uh, it tells you it's all maybe neutrophils, maybe now you're gonna send culture. We, we rarely send culture if we have a, a malignant cells, so uh, it may influence that. And maybe if you have, for example, something that looks like adeno, you, maybe you're gonna send receptors, but this you can do later on. But maybe you're gonna need to do more dedicated samples that you're gonna put in the cell block for uh, genetic testing. Uh, that, this is the last part, we'll talk about elastography. So what's elastography? It's basically an, uh, an imaging technique used to measure the dis tissue elasticity, how stiff the tissue. And the, the idea is the tumor is stiffer than uh, inflammatory cells or normal lymph nodes. And how do you do that? So it measures the difference in, hard, uh, in hardness between pathological and normal tissue response to common uh, uh, to compression or vibration. Okay, and then it, uh, it changes the signal into RGB. So either red, green, or blue. Okay, red being the softest, green is intermediate, and blue being hard. Okay, so hard is uh, thought to be tumor, like here, 
and uh, this is either normal or reactive inflammatory. Uh, so how does uh, normal inflammatory look? You basically non-blue. So if you want to think about it, all colors but not blue. So green or red. And usually the, the cortex is the hardest part, while the inside of the uh, normal lymph node tend uh, to be softer. Okay, so this is, for example, the inflammatory lymph node. You look at it, it's unsuspicious, and there's very little blue in it. When you see a lot of blue, then you start suspecting that there's tumor. Okay, so for example, you look at this lymph node, and it's all blue. So this is diffusely infiltrated by a tumor. This is something that you rarely see. So this is a lymph node, and if you look at it, it all looks homogeneous. Now, if you do your puncture, and your needle is going this way, here, Actually, if you put the elastography, you know that your needle is missing the tumor because here there's a circumscribed uh, metastasis. So this is uh, an early stage that's rarely seen where the tumor is still not occupying all the lymph node. So this is how you could miss uh, your, your tumor inside the malignant lymph node that the elastography could have a, a role. So this is all nice, so how does it perform? Uh, this is a study comparing the elastographic pattern versus pathologic uh, results. And they found, and they actually dichotomized. So they have three categories, non-blue, predominantly blue, and partially blue. But what's helpful is non-blue versus predominantly blue. So if you're predominantly blue, you're quite confident, uh, sorry, if non-blue, you're quite confident you don't have tumor, that it's benign. So your sensitivity is, is 100%. If you're predominantly blue, then you have a specificity of 95%. So you're, you're quite, conf quite confident that you have tumor. And that's what it turned out to be. So the sensitivity of categorizing lymph nodes as blue versus non-blue is 100% uh, and a specificity of 92% for malignancy. Not diagnostic, of course, uh, small studies, but it can help you guide you which lymph node to go after, maybe, and which part of the lymph node to go after, and give you some reassurance. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and uh, take questions. And it's not present in all the processors. Yes, it's not present in Olympus. Yeah, it's present, present in Pentax and Hitachi. Uh, sorry, and uh, Fuji. Fuji. Hitachi uh, is Yes, yeah. so Fuji, I should have the option there. I have 3 million dinars, I should have the option there. I have 3 million dinars, I should have the option there. I have 3 million dinars, I should have the option there. I have 3 million dinars. طبعا اي بروسيدر في الدنيا بنعمل ان احنا بلاننج بروسيدر بري بروسيدر بلاننج ان انت طبعا ان انت لازم يبقى عندك بيشنت انفورميشن لازم تعمل كونسنتنج للبيشنت لازم تاخد البيشنت يبقى فاستنج طبعا لازم عامل عنده مين سكسس وتيستنج مهم جدا لان التيستنج ده هيبقى مهم ان انت تعرف البروسيدر اللي انت تديلنج معاه ومهم جدا حكايه الستيجنج فلازم تاخد مين هيستنج اللابات الانفستيجيشنز بتعملها قبل الاند برونكو الالترا ساوند زي اي بروسكوب عادي يعني مش بنعمل بس اهم حاجه البيلينج بروفايل والليفر والجادمين البلاد جاسز لو عامل سي او بي دي وسيفير سي او بي دي يعني فير اوبستراكشن واضح ممكن نعمل بلاد جاسز احنا عشان بنشتغل لما بنشتغل بنشتغل جنرال انستيزيا فالانستيزيولوجيست بيطلب دايما ايكو كارديوجرافي لكن مش اتس نوت ماست ان انت تعمل سبيريمتري مهم جدا ان انت تعمل سي تي مفيش ايكو اسمه غير سي تي ام فدي البري بروسيدير بلانينجز اللي احنا بنعملها بالنسبه بقى اللي في حاجه لازم يبقى في انتجريتي ما بين البيشنت والاوبريتور والاكويبمنتس دي مهم جدا ان هو يبقى وان تيم كله بيشتغل مع بعض خصوصا الاوردر ازاي تدي الاوردر اللي النيدل تخش وتطلع اما النيرس بتساعدك يعني لازم يبقى اللانجوج صح نيدلز ان نيدل اوت يعني لا طلعي دخلي لان ممكن تعمل لك اكشن عكس القصه تبوظ الوركينج شانل بتاع المنظار والمنظار يبوظ بسبب ان انت بتدي اوردر غلط الاوردر لازم اللغه تبقى واضحه لان ساعات كلها طلعي شدي اعملي معرفش ايه فك السكشن فك السكشن دي ممكن تقول لها طلعي تقوم مطلعه النيدل كلها طلع الكاتيتر من غير النيدل فمهم جدا اللانجوج حكايه العيان بيبقى لو انت بتشتغل العيان جنرال انستيزيا طبعا هتنيمه على ظهره لكن لو بتشتغل بلوك الانستيزيا ممكن تنيمه على الكرسي اللي هو زي الكرسي اللي هو بتاع المناظير ده طبعا الاوبريتر عشان انت تبقى جود عشان الاناتومي يبقى اليمين يمين والشمال شمال اتس بيتر ان انت بتقف من ورا العيان، الناس اللي بتشتغل قدام العيان لان هاته بيبقى ريفرس، فده بيبقى مشكله، فلما تيجي تشتغل الليبوس خصوصا يا ديلينج مع فاسلز وكلام من ده يبقى انت تشتغل من ظهر العيان ده افضل، طبعا يبقى في تيم ورك والاكويبمنتس كلها تبقى ريدي وتبقى انتجريتد مع بعض. 
التشويس اوف انيسيزيا هو البروسيدر لاس انفيزيف وبيبقى بيتعمل على اوت بيشنت بيزز اغلبيه السنتر الصراحه بتشتغلوا لوكال انيسيزيا انا بحب افضله لما بشتغل بحب ان هو نعمله جنرال انيسيزيا بيبقى مريح اكتر طبعا لو بنشتغل باللوكال انيسيزيا بنعمل سبرينج بلايدوكين في البوستيريو فانكس دي اللي هي البلايدوكين اللي هو ليه حته طويله دي بنحطه كده في البوستيريو فانكس ونعمل ممكن قبل ما نبتدي البروسيدر نعمل نيبلايزيشن 1 ل 2% لايدوكين وان البيشنت بعد كده هو تو انتو واحنا شغالين بتسبراي بالوركينج شاندل بتاع الانذار بتسبراي از يو جو طبعا الكلاسيك تيتشنج ان انت تبتدي تعمل فايبر اوبتيك الاول تبنج العين بالفايبر اوبتيك وبعد ما تبنج العين بالفايبر اوبتيك تشتغل بعد كده دوت الكونفكس ايبوس برو وطبعا ان انت اهم حاجه ان انت عشان المنظار كبير والعين هياخد وقت في التي بي ان اي والكلام من ده فتعمل كونشس سيليشن ان انت تديله الميدازولام والميدازولام اللي انت بتديه تديه انكريمنتال دوزز يعني معاكس بتوع الجي اي تي ومحطين 3 4 ملي وحاقينهم مره واحده لا احنا بنقحن 1 ملم ب 1 ملم اما تحس ان العين اللي هو بيجي ساجنج اوف الاي ليدز وان العين بقى سلرد سنه سبيتش يبقى معناها وصل للكونشس سيليشن الكويسه وتبتدي تشتغل ممكن وانت شغال بتدي انكريمنتال دوزز 1 ملي جرام بال 1 ملي جرام ويبقى معاك الانتي دوت بتاع الميدازولام في بعض الناس الليفر طبعا عندنا ليفر ديزيز كتير في مصر فممكن اللي يحصل توكسيستي من الميدازولام فالفلومازينيل اللي هو الانتي دوت بتاع الميدازولام يفضل ان هو يكون موجود عندنا طبعا هو فيري اكسبنسيف لكن بتلاقيه في وحدات الجي اي تي اللي عندك في المستشفى لان هم بيعملوا مناظير للعين اللي عندهم هيباتك سيل فيليا بيبقى موجود فيبقى عندنا الفلومازينيل المنظار طبعا لازم يخش اورالي لان السايز بتاعه ضاع يعني وان اند هاف المنظار العادي طبعا العين بيبقى فاستنج قبليها 6 اورز وتاني حاجه واحنا شغالين بنبقى نعمل مونيتورنج للبانس اوكسيمتر وللاي سي جي والبلاد بريشر مونيتورنج صراحه يعني مكتوب في الليترشر لكن ما احنا ما بنعملش في حتى في اللوكال بلاد بريشر مونيتورنج اثناء ويمكن عملنا استدي على البرونكوسكوبي العادي انا والدكتور عماد على حكايه البلاد بريشر والاي سي جي في البرونكوسكوبي العادي ان احنا نعمل مونيتورنج للعيانين ونشوف ايه اللي بيستفاد ده بينفع بس الناس اللي عندهم كارديا كيستري لكن الناس اللي ما عندهمش كارديا كيستري ما بتفرقش ان انت تشوف له الاي سي جي مونيتورنج او تشوف له البلاد بريشر مونيتورنج الافضل ان انت تعملها في الناس دي كابنوجرافي لو عندك القابليه ان انت عندك كابنوجرافي وعين سي دي ممكن تستخدم كابنوجرافي في براكتيكلي بيزنس ما حدش بيعمل بروجنوفي في الـ في الايموس الجنرال انيسيزيا طبعا افضل واسهل والعيان بيبقى مستريح والبيت بيبقى مستريح والدنيا بيس لكن طبعا بتعرض عيان ان انت بتعمل له منظار دايجنوستيك ان انت جنرال انيسيزيا كانه بيعمل عمليه فدي برضه تبقى في كونسيدريشن طبعا السايز اوف السكوب بيبقى كبير والبروسيدر بيبقى طويل فده بيبقى مريح للعيان طبعا انت ممكن تشتغل عن طريق حاجتين يا اما تدخل الاندوتراكيال تيوب سايز 8 او اكبر طبعا دي هتبقى مشكله لو واحده في ميل بيبقى صعب ان التخدير يركب لك والاوروفانكس بتبقى صغيره والفوكال كورد صعبه فصعب ان انت تركب اندوتراكيال تيوب سايز 8 او 8 ونص فالافضل ان انت البديل ان انت تستخدم اللارنجيال ماسك اللارنجيال ماسك دي ظريفه زي ما انتم شايفين في السلايد اللارنجيال ماسك هنا هو اللي هي اللي تحت هنا هو بتاع على ابواب الليفر والفوكال كورد وفيها ديفرنت سايزز فممكن ان انت تشتغل منها ودي بتبقى ظريفه ودي ميزتها ان انت بتقدر تشوف الفوكال كورد وان انت تقدر تعمل بنج للفوكال كوردز كويس طبعا الجيرال ماسك عيبها ان انت مش هتقدر تستخدمها في الاوبيس او الناس اللي عندهم جرد او الناس اللي عندهم بالمونري فايبروز عشان يعني الجرد هيزوده العيانين اللي هتجنرال انستيزيا هي مسؤوليه الانستيزيولوجيست ودي ظريفه ان انت لما بتعمل منظار وبتعمله اندر جنرال انستيزيا فبتشيل من من راحتك ان انت مسؤوليه الاير واي والمشاكل اللي ممكن تحصل اثناء البروسيدر بيبقى انت بتركز في المنظار بس ودي بتبقى ميزه ان ان الاناتيسيولوجيست بيشيل الشيله يعني هم طبعا بيدوا ماسكولر يعني نيورو ماسكولر بلوكينج ايجنت وبنحط العين على ميكانيكال فنتريشن كنترول مانداتري وبيدي توتال انترافينس اناتيزيا اغلبيه الناس هنا بتستخدم الميدازولام مع الفنتانيل في ديفرنت ويز كل سنتر ليه القصص بتاعته لكن اغلبيه الناس بتدي الميدازولام مع الفنتانيل طبعا المونيتورنج هو اللي بيستخدم المونيتورنج بيبقى الاي سي جي وبلاد بريشر بقى هنا بقى فعلا لما بنشتغل جنرال بيبقى فيه بلاد بريشر مونيتورنج والاوكسجين تنشن يبقى احنا ما عندناش ما بنعملهاش كابنوجرافي فما بنستخدمش الكابنوجرافي لكن لقوا ان هي لما قارنوا الناس اللي اشتغلوا بالجنرال انيسيزيا والناس اللي اشتغلوا باللوكال انيسيزيا ما لقوش كدايجنوستيك يبقى فيه فروقات يعني كان الناس اللي هو بيشتغلوا بالجنرال قال لك احنا بنشتغل جنرال عشان نقدر ناخد ييلز احسن مش حقيقي اللي بيشتغل لوكال زي اللي بيشتغل جنرال اللي بيستريح بس فرق الجنرال ان الدكتور والعيان بيستريحوا لكن الييلد واحد فهي ماتر اوف ريفرنس صراحه 
ويعني مع الوقت الواحد مع الوقت لقى ان هو الجنرال انا في وجهه نظري مع مع الوقت الجنرال بيبقى اسهل في اي بروسيدر لو كان البيشنت سبيشالي سسبيشس والبيشنت بيبقى اجيتي لو نقارن الجنرال بال بالمودريت سيديشن لوكال انيسيزيا بالجنرال هيستخدم اللارنجيال ماسك والادرو تراكير تيوب البرو ان هو بتسكيو في الجنرال انيسيزيا بتسكيور الاير واي وبتنجيز البيشنت كومفورت والدكتور كومفورت يبقى في سيفتي عيبها ان انت بيبقى في ليميتد لل طبعا الليميتيشن للانيسيزيا وبتزود الكوست تاني حاجه لما بتستخدم الجنرال انيسيزيا بتستخدم الادرو تراكير تيوب الابر بارا تراكير زي ما الدكتور حسن قال لكم الابر بارا تراكير بتبقى في الابر فايف فايف رينجز فممكن ان انت تبقى صعب تعمل مانيبيوليشن لو انت مركب ادو تراكير تيوب فبتبقى صعب. لو انت بتستخدم بقى المودريت سيديشن بلوكال انيسيزيا طبعا التمن الفنتانيل اللي هو الغالي جدا بتتجنبه تاني حاجه ان انت بتعمل مش في الاو ار انت عشان تعمل جنرال انيسيزيا مش اي واحد الاو ار الاندوسكوبي سويت تنفع تتقلب جنرال فبتضطر تاخد العين اوضه العمليات العين بتشتغلوا باللوكال بتشتغلوا في وحده المناظير بتاعتك فدي بتبقى ميزه كويسه لكن طبعا العيان بيبقى مشكله العيان انا دايما بقول المنظار عباره عن كحه كل المنظار هيبقى فيه كحه كتير فدي بتبقى مقلقه ليك وساعات بتعصب الشخص اللي هو بيعمل المنظار من العيان اللي هو معاك عمال يكح 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 فدي بتبقى مشكله فهي دي عيوب القصه دي طبعا العيان ممكن يبقى دي سيفيري فده الفرق ما بين اللوكال والجنرال واحنا بنعمل ايه بس بعد البروسيدير بقى الايفالويشن ان انت بتعمل سيرفيلانس بعد ما العيان بيعمل البروسيدير زي اي برونكوسكوبي بتبص على العيان لو في خلال اول نص ساعه لساعه في ساينز اوف انسبيراتري ستريس تشوف الفايتال ساينز اوف كونشسنس وشوف الاوكشن لو كان طبعا مديله ميدازولام يفضل ان انت تسيبه على الاقل ساعه بعديها على اوكشن ثيرابي لو انت بتاخد بايوبسيز وفي مشاكل بتعمل تشيست اكس راي وطبعا بتديله فيربر وريتن انفورميشن ومهم جدا الفيربر وريتن انفورميشن يا مره كنا كنت عملنا الصدي برضو على البيشنت ساتسفاكشن البرونكوسكوبي من اهم الحاجات اللي قالها لنا البيشنتس في الاستدي دي ان الدكتور بعد ما بيعمل المنظار ما بيقولش الانفورميشن كويس ولا بيقول للعيان هيعمل ايه ويسيبه بيمشي فده بيدي ده اللي خلى ان العيان لما بيقولوا له هتيجي تعمل المنظار تاني هتعمله ولا لا مش عشان قصه ان هو تعب في المنظار بيقول لك انا ما فيش اي انفورميشن اديت لي بعد المنظار فكلامك مع العيان بعد المنظار مهم جدا وتقول له الاكشن اللي بعد كده هيعمل ايه وان انت لقيت ايه مش كلمتين وتجري عشان تشتغل اللي بعديها فهي دي بتبقى بتفرق جدا مع العيان وبتدي انفورميشن كويس. الكومبليكيشنز طبعا اللي بتحصل يعني هو يوجولي سيف بروسيدر كومبليكيشنز ما فيش سيريس كومبليكيشنز صراحه بتحصل لكن يعني ريبورتد كومبليكيشن بتحصل طبعا نتيجه ممكن اجيتيشن هايبوكسيميا لارنجيل انجري فيفر بكتيريميا انفكشن بليدنج نيوموثوركس طبعا مش يعني حاجات نادره ان حته من النيدل دي تتكسر فتبقى بروكن، النيدل ممكن تتكسر حتى في قبل كده مره كنت بعمل تي بي ان ايه عاديه يعني كونفنشنال النيدل اتكسرت جوه فالراجل بتاع كنت شغال مع تخدير قال لي ايه ده وكان مشكله كبيره قلت له عباره عن فورم بودي كان واحد بارع ابره يعني ابره دبوس زي ما بتطلعها الفورم بودي شدتها فمفيش مشكله من ديستاينال ابسس ممكن تحصل دي عباره عن ريبورتد كيسز طبعا لو انت بتشتغل باللوكال انيسيزيا الابر اير واي ممكن يحصل طبعا نتيجه المانيبيوليشن ممكن يحصل لارنجيال سبازم قديمه وبرونكو سبازم. في بقى لو انت بتدي سيديشن لو اوفر سيديشن ممكن تعمل سبايرال ديبريشن او تعمل فوميتنج او كارديك انستابيلتي ده وقتها يعني. الكونترا انديكيشن هي الكونترا انديكيشن بتاع اي منظار مش هخش في التفاصيل لكن البليدنج خلي بالك ان انت لو العيان بالذات الناس اللي هم دلوقتي الكارديك وبياخدوا كلافكس لازم تبطلوا قبليه على الاقل بخمس ست ايام دي مهم جدا عشان البليدنج بروبلمز يعني. شكرا حد عنده اي سؤال الميدازولام بنستخدم انكريمنتال دوز 1 ملغ باي 1 ملغ ما بنعملش زي اللي هي الحكايه تدي لودنج وبعد كده تدي مينتنس انا بستخدم 1 ملغ واشوف العين واقعد اتكلم معاه ابتدى العيان تلاقي حواجبه بتسقط لسانه بيتقل يبقى العيان ده Now we're going to move to uh, talk about uh, some of the problems that you will face uh, while performing EVOS. So uh, the uh, procedure breakdown is uh, basically intubating the trachea first, visualizing the lymph node, puncturing the lymph node, and then obtaining the sample. And you may face problems with each one of those steps. The, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf already alluded to the uh, problem of uh, trying to intubate the trachea, and it has to do with the 
side uh, uh, optics. <coughs> so the focus of your uh, complex probe is actually to look at the wall. So that's why everyth everything is on the side. Instead, the, the, uh, the optics are not at the tip. They're here, on the side. And they go at an angle. This angle varies between manufacturer and similar to uh, what Dr. Ashraf said. It's uh, you know, about 30 degrees, 50 degrees with Pentast, about 30 degrees with uh, uh, Olympus, and 10 degrees with Hitachi. Not Hitachi, sorry, Fuji. Keep saying Hitachi. Um, so there's two issues. The first, the optics are not on the tip. Second, it's sideways. So while you're doing conventional bronchoscopies and you're trying to get through the vocal cord, this is the, vision, the image that you used to see. But the problem if you're seeing this, it means your scope is going behind the vocal cord into the esophagus, or you're hitting uh, so the arytenoid uh, fossa or uh, other structure, but you're not going in the vocal cord if you're like that, because this is what you're seeing, and this is exactly how the scope is going. Um, and you're not seeing the distal end of the scope. So when you're when you're looking, this part you don't see. So it's like you're a unicorn that has the eyes here, and then they have something going up from the head, and you don't see it. So you can bang in, in the in the walls. Um, so if you're seeing this, it means your scope is extended. This is what you need to see to be able to get through the vocal cords. You need to have the imagine as if you're sliding down the epiglottis. So once you see the epiglottis, you go under it, and then you try to slide down at, uh, along the wall. Okay. And once you get there, all you need to do is flex your scope backwards, and you're inside the trachea. Then it becomes very simple. Okay. So remember, this is what you need to see. The anterior commissure. You should not be seeing the vocal cord like this. I mean, you can take a look, see it, and then readjust your scope. Um, so, to be able to go through the scope, this is what you need to see. That's, that's just another way of looking at it. That's your vision. It means now the tip of your scope is heading towards the trachea through the vocal cords. And once you're in the trachea, you're facing the same problem. You're used to see this. This is what you see in the conventional bronchoscope. But in the EBOSCOPE, this is what you're seeing. Similar. If you want to now navigate, and you're seeing this, your tip of the scope is hitting all the walls, and you're going to find it difficult to get in the uh, right main stem or left main stem. So you should uh, get used to, uh, maybe if you want to see the vocal cord, uh, sorry, the carina, just flex it a bit, you see where you are, and then relax it, and then move. Uh, and that you do that little by little. Um, the Fuji scope, uh, I think, offers a significant advantage uh, with regard to navigation. And uh, first, you have uh, only a 10 degree tilt. So, even with the uh, scope not flexed, just in the uh, neutral position, you're able to see what's happening at the tip. You're able to see the tip of your scope, and you're able to see what's beyond it without moving the scope. So, the navigation is much easier. Um, and uh, the other thing, uh, also the ultrasound is also wider. Uh, but for navigation, what's important is that you're able to see beyond and you're able uh, uh, to see distal here. And even the needle, you can see the catheter uh, going out and the needle going out, which you don't see well in the uh, uh, Olympus and in the Pantax school. The other problem that you may find is uh, you go through, before you get to the vocal cords, you're just getting, you're going through the mouth and the larynx, you're, and you're unable to visualize anything. Everything is closed. Okay? You're unable to, to visualize the epiglottis. So um, the easiest things to do is just ask your assistant just to pull the, uh, or lift the jaw. All you need to do is just to uh, reposition the neck, um, and everything is going to open up in front of you. It may be even more challenging, so um, then you kind of have to do the jaw thrust, and this is what it uh, shows. So the same maneuver that you use to intubate patients uh, or open the airways. So either uh, a chin lift or a jaw thrust will help you open the airway. If the patient is awake, sometimes you just tell them to stick their tongue out, and also it will help you visualize. So these are some of the tricks. They're quite easy, and they make your life easier.
that's of course if you're doing it with conscious sedation. I, I do my procedures with conscious sedation. I don't intubate the patient. Uh, so uh, these maneuvers are helpful. If you're using a laryngeal mask or the patient is intubated, this becomes irrelevant. Um, the other problem is trouble visualizing the lymph nodes. Um, this is more likely to occur in the trachea than in the distal uh, airways. In the distal airways, uh, you know, the, the airway is small, so there's more support for the uh, scope uh, to be able to get opposed against the wall. You need, you need a, a good opposition against the wall. In the trachea, this is, uh, you know, the size is bigger, so sometimes it's harder, especially if there's you know, a cyber sheet trachea sometimes, or if there's bronchial malacia, then it's a, a trachea malacia, then it's uh, harder. So what you use is basically inflate the balloon. Um, sometimes if you're doing, uh, uh, you know, station 11 or 10, you may not need to put the balloon at all. But in the trachea, you always need to have the balloon uh, to be able to visualize the lymph node well. Okay? And then you will have a better opposition against the wall and better image. Now when you're visualizing, you can get several artifacts, okay, from the ultrasound. And uh, we'll go over them. The, there's the tadpole uh, artifact, the acoustic shadow artifact, which are opposite, the reverberation artifact. And uh, usually it's because of hypo or hyperechoic structures uh, in the lymph nodes. This is the reverber reverberation artifact. So here uh, it occurs usually be, uh, when with the balloon inflated. Okay, these are all false echoes. So what's happening is that the ultrasound are hitting uh, the uh, the water and uh, then the bronchial wall and you having repeated movements and reverberation of the um, uh, ultrasound waves so you, you get a duplication. So these are all false echoes. Okay, so if it occurs if there's no intimate contact uh, of the balloon with the uh, wall, so all you need is basically to inflate more and then it should go away. Um, and uh, so don't be surprised when you see this. The other artifact that you see commonly is the tadpole uh, tail artifact, and usually it occurs when you have a hypoechoic structure such as the azygous. So uh, this is the lung here, and this is the azygous, and this is the tadpole tail artifact. It's the echo that occurs because of the uh, ultrasound wave going from a hypoechoic structure to a hyperechoic structure, and then you get all this. Um, artifact, it's a, it's a tail. All you need to do is just to move your scope a bit and it goes away. Uh, and, and sometimes you just learn to ignore it. Uh, your, your brain gets used to it and it's subtracted. The acoustic shadow is the opposite. So sometimes if you have something uh, hyperechoic inside uh, a lymph node, say here, uh, for example, you have a calcification, or sometimes after uh, you do your puncture, sometimes you put debris with you. So after the first puncture, uh, when you go in, if you hit the cartilage, for example, uh, you can get debris. Even there have been reports of small metallic pieces from the um, uh, from the needle that get deposited inside the lymph node. This was shown on uh, post-op. So after someone had a knee bus procedure and they go to get their lymph node dissection, they can see small metal piece. So these would actually uh, also create uh, an interface where the ultrasound wave would travel at uh, different uh, speeds, and then you will get this uh, acoustic shadow artifact that occur beyond it. So you have now a hypoechoic signal after this hyperechoic uh, structure here. Uh, the last and very common artifact is the air artifact, basically because you don't have good opposition. So uh, if you're, for example, on the side of the airway and part of the uh, ultrasound is against the wall and the other part is still dangling in the air, that's what you're going to see. Okay, so this is uh, called air artifact and all you need to do is to inflate your balloon again. So you, but the balloon is the best friend here to get past all these artifacts. If your ultrasound image is too dark, you have two things, you have two knobs, then you have to move to the, um, uh, the ultrasound processor and you have two knobs, the gain uh, and the contrast. And each manufacturer have a different uh, machines, so you make sure you play with it a bit uh, before, uh, it, uh, at some point, when, when even when things are going well, just try to change, ask to change the contrast, change the game. Usually it's preset for optimal, but things may change with time, so it's important to, to know uh, what, uh, 
uh, you know, how to optimize your picture. So this is too dark. So if you increase the gain, then all of it will become a bit whiter. Uh, and if you increase the contrast, then the white will become whiter and the black will become uh, darker. So these are quite helpful at seeing the, the border better. Sometimes you also have trouble visualizing the lymph nodes, and it may be uh, while puncturing most commonly. So sometimes you saw your lymph nodes, um, and you stick the needle out, and then suddenly you lose your image. So what do, what do you do? What you're achieving, what you're trying to achieve is real-time puncture. Okay, you want to be safe, you want to make sure your needle went where you want it to be, you saw your green dot, and even some of the processor, uh, Fuji for example, show you the uh, the trajectory, how your, how your uh, needle is going to go, but then after you puncture, you lose the image, and that's because your ultrasound is basically pushed out. So here you see the catheter, you have deployed the needle, uh, and uh, so you don't you don't see the, your uh, needle or lymph node anymore. So what you do, uh, you just retract the needle a bit inside, not all the way, and then you push the ultrasound at the mouth. So if you're doing it. Or somebody is assisting. Usually, when I puncture, I ask my assistant to hold the, ultra, uh, the bronchoscope at the mouth. So I pull the needle in a bit, not all the way. It's already stuck in the mucosa, but not all. I'm not sure if it's in the lymph node or not. And I ask my assistant to push the uh, bronchoscope at the mouth, and then I shove it again. And now, most of the time, uh, I do it. Another uh, thing is to just to reattempt. To, uh, to puncture all the, all the way, so retract everything and re-attempt to puncture, and, or again, inflate the balloon. The other thing that you may do is the stylet, uh, which this is the last resort. So usually, there's a stylet inside the needle, and the reason for the stylet is you don't wanna fill the needle with bronchial tissue. You want your to capture all, only the lymph node. So while puncturing, you still have the stylet in, and then you remove it inside. When you're inside the lymph node, to suction. So sometimes well, you, you'd be forced to just pull the stylet a bit in so that the needle becomes sharper because the stylet makes the, uh, the needle less sharp. Um, and, and same thing, same technique you use it if you're having uh, trouble puncturing the lymph nodes. This will also occur most commonly in the trachea because you don't have enough opposition and because the cartilage is bigger. So most of the time what's happening is that you're trying to puncture and your needle is hitting against the cartilage. Okay, so what you need to do is try to move a bit, retract the needle, move a bit up, so that you're, or, or down, most of the time up, because the, uh, with, the, with the needle being jabbed in, you tend to move the scope down. So you always try to adjust and try to get a higher puncture, and that would help you. Um, so, uh, you retract the needle, change position of the scope, scope and you, you re advance. And again, the same uh, tip applies for the stylet. Uh, and the good thing is that the first puncture is always the hardest. Once you have, you do your first uh, puncture, two things happen. The needle is bent a bit, so it follows a nicer angle. And the second thing, you already have a track. So it goes, the needle will slip, slip through that track. Um, sometimes you can get an image like this. And that's not good because now you can't get your lymph nodes. Okay, your lymph you have a blood vessel interfere interposing uh, between you and the lymph node. So I've, I've only had it once where I, where I couldn't. Uh, most of the time you can maneuver, you can move your scope up, you can move your scope down, and try to find a clear shot to, uh, toward the lymph node. But it occurred once and I couldn't predict it uh, on the CT. Uh, after I went in, said, sorry, I can't get to it except going through the pulmonary artery, which I, I didn't want to do. Uh, and this is just the same image with the uh, doctor showing you the how the lesion is all surrounded uh, by blood flow. Now, sometimes after you puncture, you don't see your needle. So what happens is that uh, during the puncture, uh, the scope has probably moved, so your ultrasound is in a different plane. So all you need to do is just move your wrist back. Okay, just moving the wrist will move the angle. So now you're, what happened is that you puncture the needle this way and, the, and, and your scope is, is pulled this way. So your needle is stuck this way and your scope is looking this way. So all you need to do is just to readjust and, and you'll find it. Um, it's a bit confusing. It can be confusing for a second. You just have to remember 
It's like, oh, where my, where's my needle? Sometimes you think, oh, did it go too superficial? Did it go too superficial under the cartilage? Or, or what happened? Um, you can also have problems with the needle itself. So with repeated juice, uh, the needle may become really hard. So uh, it, you know, trying to push the sample out, it may be the, the wire, use the wire. So like I said, first you puncture the wire, it's still in, you remove it, you get your sample out with the uh, negative suction. And then when you want to get the sample outside the, the needle, you use the wire to push it back out. And sometimes it becomes hard to, uh, to push. Usually, within three passes, you're fine. But once you go after three passes, you may have to start having difficulties. We even once had the, uh, the tip, the plastic holder of the uh, stylet broken. So you're gonna have to stop and uh, use another needle. And sometimes if the, need, if the sample is very bloody, then you can get the sample coagulating inside it and blocking it. Uh, so uh, very important to try not to get uh, bloody samples. And sometimes you can do that by, we'll, we'll cover it by, by not putting negative pressure. So you can just puncture without the syringe being hooked to negative pressure. Now moving to the last part, you want to get adequate specimens. So what's considered adequate if you see malignant cells, granulomas, pigment laden macrophages, or lymphocytes. And adequate if there was no cellular component, uh, very little lymphocytes, or bloody only, or if it's full bronchial epithelial cells. So if you're having inadequate aspirates, usually that you will learn that by uh, having a cytologist on site. If you don't, then you don't know until the end of the procedure. So um, you just have to try to resample, trying to target different areas of the lymph nodes. Um, and uh, it's very important to know that you're more likely to get a good specimen at the periphery of the lymph node. Everybody is trying, you know, like always try to try to get the center of the lymph node, but the center will have either, if it's benign, it tends to be a fatty center, so, or, and if it's malignant, then you may have necrosis. So you have to try to avoid the center. If it's shallow, it's good, actually, okay? You don't, or, or if you went through it, then try to push the needle all the way to get to the other side of the, the lymph node, right below the capsule. So try to go through and through. Don't be happy with your needle sitting in the middle of the lymph node, okay? So that would uh, improve your yield. Uh, but also know that reattempting will not improve your yield beyond three. So all the studies have shown that beyond three passes, you're unlikely to get better, uh, better yield. We only use these extra passes sometimes is to collect material for genetic testing if you want to put the whole samples in the uh, cell block. Um, like I said, if you're getting uh, bloody aspirates, it may be that uh, you have uh, the, the lymph node may be too vascularized. This tends to occur more commonly in the subcarinal. The subcarinal lymph node tend to be more vascularized than the other lymph nodes. Or if you have renal cell CA, sometimes you have metastatic renal cell CA, these tumors tend to especially be uh, vascular. So with this situation, the doctor would be helpful in trying to get your needle. So for example, if you're gonna puncture here, uh, you can guess that, uh, so you can guess that your needle is going to go here and it's going to hit this vessel, okay? So maybe if you advance your scope a bit and you can go in this area that doesn't have vascularity or here, this area, you want to try to avoid it. So this is, the doctor could be helpful, number one. Number two, what could be helpful is not to put negative <coughs> pressure. So you do it without aspiration. So you puncture with a needle, you remove your wire and you just move the needle back and forth uh, like a, just a regular thyroid FNA, you don't you don't put the negative pressure syringe uh, attached to the needle. Um, so these are the two tips for that. Now, with regard to the sample smearing and quality, it's very important uh, for the technicians to be well trained um, and to talk to the cytologist. Sometimes it's important to get the cytologist to train your technician that's helping you on how to smear and have feedback because otherwise you can get a lot of artifacts. So the sample could coagulate, there could be air drying uh, artifact, air bubble, the smear could be too thick or crushed. So the sample coagulation may happen at the needle the lumen uh, or on the slide surface, and it's usually because of delay. So when you take your needle out, you want to try directly to remove it. You don't want to just put it on the side and do other thing and then uh, handle it because the sample will come, uh, 
uh, coagulate. So the key is to express the sample uh, immediately. Air drying artifact also happen if you don't smear right away. So sometimes the technician may put the drop on the on the slide and wait, maybe do something else, and then smear it, uh, clean your needle for you or something. Uh, so I usually ask that uh, I can wait, no problem. Just do the smearing first. So you, you make sure they do the smear uh, while the sample is still wet, otherwise you're gonna get drying artifact. Uh, this is the opposite of what you wanna do for the uh, rose. In rose, you want it to dry. In uh, the pathology, you want it to be still wet when you put it in the uh, alcohol solution or other fixative that you use. And also the smear, you don't want it to be too thick. If you have two layers of cells and the cytologist can't see anything, uh, it has to be too thin. So you have to put really just one drop of blood and, and smear it. Uh, and uh, so don't put too much. Uh, and crushed smear can occur if they put too excessive pressure while they're uh, moving the two slides on top of each other. Uh, so they have to be gentle. And uh, that's it. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. ultrasound is safely and comfortably performed in the bronchoscopy suite under moderate sedation. It can also be done under general anesthesia. In this case, EBIS is performed using a laryngeal mask airway or endotracheal tube. The LMA permits evaluation of the upper paratracheal nodes, namely 2R and 2L, which are less easily accessible if an endotracheal tube is used. tube is secured and a bite block is inserted before introducing the EBIS bronchoscope. On the following slides, we will describe the EBIS bronchoscope, image processor, and needle. Curved array alternation of bronchial cells. Prior to EBIS, white blood bronchoscopic <coughs> inspection is performed and the airways are cleared of secretions. After airway inspection, the balloon is inflated so that a small crescent of it is seen. control button on the ultrasound processor alternates between the bronchoscopic and ultrasound image. Dual or single monitors with picture-in-picture -picture display are useful. After sonographic evaluation of the nodal and vascular structures of the mediastinum, the operator selects the target node and proceeds with EMIS TVMA.
Let's now review the EBIS TBNA procedure for 15 steps. First, the needle is inserted into the working channel. Then the housing is secured to the bronchoscope by sliding the flange. The sheet is released by twisting the inferior screw. With the node visualized by ultrasound, the sheet is advanced out of the end of the scope until it slightly touches the airway wall. It is now safe to advance the needle. The needle screw located superiorly is then released, and the needle is advanced by jabbing it into the lymph node. During this process, the needle may push the airway wall away from the balloon. The transducer wall interface might become lost, and the image may show reverberation artifact. This problem is overcome by gently advancing the scope or further inflating the balloon. Once the needle is visualized within the lymph node, the stylet is moved in and out a few times to dislodge any bronchial epithelium that may have entered the needle. Stylet is then withdrawn from the scope. The syringe is attached to the needle. And suction is applied. The needle can be moved back and forth within the node approximately 10 to 15 times under ultrasound visualization. Suction is then released by removing the syringe from the scope, and the entire needle is retracted into the sheath. Then the needle housing is unlocked, and the needle and the sheath are removed together. The aspirated material is smeared onto glass slides, labeling the lymph node site and pass number. In this instructional video, we described the basic principles and steps for performing EBIS TBNA using a dedicated EBIS bronchoscope with a 7.5 MHz linear array transducer. Currently available technologies allow frequency changes and directional Doppler capabilities that further enhance image acquisition. This procedure has become standard of practice for diagnosis and staging mediastinal and hyalolymphadenopathy in patients with confirmed or suspected lung cancer. For a better understanding of endobronchial ultrasound images and their correlation with computed tomography, please visit us at www. I am very much happy that aspiration can be used as a syringe and can be used as a syringe. The results are the same. The story that we are doing negative suction can be used as a negative suction and the study is that the one who does a syringe is the one who does a syringe. It doesn't matter. But the feeling of the person is that we always want to do it. النيجاتيف سكشن لان احنا تعودنا في الكونفنشن التي بي ان ان احنا بنعمل النيجاتيف سكشن لكن الاستاذ اللي بعد كده هو قالت ان هو ما فيش فرق تاني حاجه ان انت تعمل كم عدد من الباس زي ما الدكتور حسن قال ان انت بتعمل تلاتة تلاتة بعد التلاتة ما بتفرقش لو انت بتعمل اون سايت روز يعني بتجيب بيبقى اتنين كفايه فهو اكتر من تلاتة مش مطلوب يعني دلوقتي الستايل بيبقى داخل اخر البور بتاعت الاندي كلها في الاول يعني الاستاذ ده انا انا ليه بعمل جيم <تصفيق> عشان انت المفروض ان انت بتعمل ستيجنج لو انت اي ديبرس وانت داخل من الاير واي جه على على النيدل دي ممكن يغير لك من يكون الماليجن سيلز دي موجوده في الاير واي ايوه لا ممكن يبقى حصل كونتامينيشن فانت بتخاف عشان كده عشان كده حتى حكايه الاوردر في ان انت السكشن اما انت تيجي اما انت تيجي طالع من المنظار حتى في التي بي ايه العاديه بتفك السكشن الاول ان انت لو ما فكيتش السكشن وطلعت النيدل بره الاير واي ممكن النيدل تاخد سكريشنز من الاير واي دي تكون مالجنت فتغير لك الستيج فعشان كده مهم جدا القصه قصه ان انت الستيجنج دي النيدل اللي بتبقى محطوط الستايل اللي بتبقى محطوطه وبتزقها عشان لو في اي ديبرس وانت داخل دخل في النيدل بتزقه بره Over the last decade, endobronchial ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration has rapidly become the standard for histologic sampling of mediastinal lymph nodes. This video will describe the technique for performing EPOS FNA and will highlight procedures that will optimize specimen yield and improve staging accuracy. 
There are currently three manufacturers of Bemis bronchoscopes, Olympus, Pentax, and Fujifilm. All three scopes share a similar design and feature a flexible bronchoscope with an integrated linear ultrasound array at the distal end. A working channel allows passage of a flexible biopsy needle which, once deployed, exits the end of the scope at an oblique angle to the scope axis. A light source and fiber optic are also present at the distal end of the scope, proximal to the ultrasound transducer, and are oriented in the same forward oblique plane as the biopsy channel. The degree of off-axis view varies between as little as 10 degrees for the Fuji scope to as much as 45 degrees in the Pentax model. A disposable balloon is placed over the ultrasound transducer, which is filled with saline in order to optimize acoustic coupling with the wall of the airway. The procedure may be performed either with sedation and topical anesthetics or under general anesthesia. We prefer the use of total intravenous general anesthesia using propofol infusion and short-acting narcotics and muscle relaxants, as this results in a quiet operative field, ensures adequate ventilation, and is more comfortable for patients. Use of a laryngeal mask airway allows examination of the vocal cords and the higher paratracheal stations, which may be difficult to visualize using an endotracheal oh, tube. However, patients at risk of aspiration, those requiring high airway pressures, and patients with a history of supraglottic tumors or neck irradiation may be better served with a standard endotracheal tube. A size 8.5 or 9 endotracheal tube, or size 4 or 5 laryngeal mask airway is required for EBOS to allow sufficient collateral airflow around the bronchoscope to maintain ventilation. The procedure begins with an endobronchial examination using an adult bronchoscope to rule out occult endobronchial disease and to clear secretions which may impair visualization when using the EBOS scope. Remember, the tip of the EBOS scope lies below the forward view of the scope. Thus, when traversing the vocal cords, the scope must be flexed upwards to allow the tip of it to pass over the retinoids and into the upper trachea. Once in the trachea, the balloon is gently inflated until a small crescent is visualized. Overinflation of the balloon is unnecessary and may limit airflow around the scope, especially in the main bronchi. A systematic ultrasound survey is then performed. We typically start by examining the 11L station, then slowly withdraw the scope to the left tracheobronchial angle where the left main pulmonary artery and ascending aorta are visualized with the 4L nodes residing between them. The scope is then withdrawn proximally along the left side of the trachea, keeping the aorta in view, and noting the takeoff of the anomalous artery. Station 2L is examined. Note the importance of slow rotational sweeps as the scope is slowly moved proximally to interrogate the paratracheal space. The scope is rotated to the right side of the trachea, keeping the artery in view. This allows visualization of the 2R station. Next, the carina is identified under white light, and the scope passed into the right main bronchus and rotated to face the medial aspect of the right main bronchus where the subcarinal node will be seen. Occasionally, visualization of the station 7 node is better from the left main bronchus. Finally, the 11R station is examined, and the scope is then slowly withdrawn to the right tracheobronchial angle where the 4R nodes are identified proximal to the azimuth vein. Normal anatomic landmarks visible on white light bronchoscopy will help the operator determine the correct orientation and position of the scope. At each station, the diameter of the lymph node is recorded. For lung cancer staging, nodes 5 millimeters in size or greater are biopsied. The ultrasound survey helps define the order in which nodal stations will be biopsied, allows assistance to prepare the slides, and ensures a logical sequence of nodal sampling from contralateral to ipsilateral mediastinal, and finally to ipsilateral hyaline. A 21 or 22 gauge flexible biopsy needle is passed through the biopsy channel and secured to the bronchoscope by a flange. Take care to check that the needle is fully retracted before insertion and that the bronchoscope is in a neutral position. Otherwise, the stiffness of the sheath may damage the delicate inner coating of the biopsy channel if the scope is in a flexed position. One may lose the ultrasound image while passing the needle, but in most cases, once the needle is seated, the ultrasound image can be reestablished. The exception to this is the occasional instance when extreme flexion is required to visualize the target node. This occurs most often at the 4L nodal station because of the near right angle takeoff of the left main bronchus with the trachea. When the sheath is in place, it limits the degree of flexion possible by the scope. Additional inflation of the balloon may sometimes compensate and allow the image to be restored, but often the scope has to be retracted slightly and the node sampled from a more proximal position. To avoid damaging the bronchoscope, it's imperative that the needle not be deployed until the tip of the sheath has been positioned outside the end of the bronchoscope. To do this, the sheath screw is loosened and the sheath is carefully advanced until the tip is just visible in the white light image. 
it's important not to advance too much of the sheet as it would interfere with the quality of the ultrasound image by pushing the wall of the airway away from the transducer. Once a millimeter or two of sheet is outside the bronchoscope, the sheet is locked in place. One will notice that when the needle is first advanced, that it drags some of the sheet out of the bronchoscope along with it, which can lead to inaccurate needle placement and degradation of the ultrasound image. It is therefore ideal to have the tip of the needle just at the end of the sheet so that this latent drag effect does not occur. One method of doing this is to begin slowly advancing the needle, keeping a careful eye on the sheet as it begins to creep out of the bronchoscope. As it advances, a subtle downward dip or deflection of the sheet will occur. At this point, the needle tip lies just behind the end of the sheet, and further advancement of the needle will not cause any more of the sheet to be pushed out of the bronchoscope. With the needle and sheet in this position, the sheet can then be carefully retracted back into the bronchoscope, the needle along with it, until the tip is just visible in the white light image. The needle is now set, and the target node can be located again using ultrasound. Mucous blood or other airway debris can sometimes make it impossible to obtain a clear image of the sheath. In this case, one can ensure that the sheath is out of the end of the bronchoscope by moving it in and out of the bronchoscope and observing the distortion of the ultrasound image at the upper right-hand corner. This is caused by the end of the sheath pushing against the airway wall. Under direct ultrascopic visualization, the needle is advanced across the airway wall and into the lymph node. There are a couple of points that are worth noting about needle deployment. First, with the stylet fully pumped, the tip of the needle appears blunt. Therefore, retracting the stylet one or two millimeters prior to performing the puncture presents a sharper end to the needle that will help transit. Second, it is not infrequent that the needle will encounter cartilage. Advancing the needle with a quick and forceful jab often allows the needle to penetrate the tissue better than a slow and steady advance, which often just succeeds in pushing the wall of the airway further away from the transducer with consequent loss of image. Should this occur, it's often helpful to have an assistant hold the bronchoscope at the level of the endotracheal tube, or LMA, and push it deeper into the airway while the operator maintains the needle in the deployed position. Once the needle has entered the lymph node, it is sometimes necessary to make fine rotational adjustments to the scope to optimize the image. The entire length of the needle within the node should be visualized. If excessive sheath has also advanced during needle deployment, which can sometimes lessen the image quality, the sheet may be carefully retracted until an optimal image is regained. By default, the needle will advance two centimeters from the end of the sheet, and for most applications, this is sufficient. A removable stop can be detached, which allows the needle to extend an additional two centimeters into the lymph node. This is useful in biopsying larger lymph nodes. Once in the node, the stylet is agitated to push any retained bronchial epithelium or cartilaginous debris out of the needle lumen. The stylet is then withdrawn and the needle is plunged in and out of the lymph node 10 to 15 times. It's the rapid downstroke that results in the cutting action required to liberate cellular material. The needle should be passed across the entire node from cortex to cortex, as the subcortical regions often harbor metastases. By stabilizing the operating hand on the bronchoscope using the fourth and fifth digits, the thumb and index finger can be used to move the needle in a controlled and accurate manner. Use of suction is controversial. The downside of suction is that it results in a more bloody aspirate, particularly in vascular nodes such as those in the subcarotid space. The more blood in the aspirate, the more hemodilution there will be of lymphocytes and the more clot in the specimen, both of which hinder cytologic interpretation. However, more material can be obtained using suction. For small or hydraulic nodes, it is often required. If suction is used, no more than one or two cc's of negative pressure should be applied. If no suction is used, the specimen tends to be less blood and has greater purity of the sample. However, the amount of specimen is generally smaller. We often perform the first pass at each station without suction and then apply it. When using suction, it's important to remember to release the negative pressure before withdrawing the needle. Otherwise, bronchial epithelium and other debris may be suctioned into the specimen as the needle traverses the airway wall. Once the aspirate has been obtained, the needle is fully withdrawn back into the sheath and then taken out of the bronchoscope and handed to the assistant. It's often helpful to rotate two needles so that one may be used by the operator while the specimen is being removed from the other. At least three separate punctures per node station are performed. Thus, for a staging procedure where four or five separate node stations may be examined, as many as 12 to 20 punctures will be routinely performed. This is one of the reasons why we prefer to perform these procedures on the general. Efficient specimen handling is vital. Once obtained, the specimen should be quickly handed off to the assistant who advances the needle from the sheath. 
The stylet is reinserted, which pushes aspirated material out of the needle. A single drop of aspirate should be placed at one end of the label slide, and another spreader slide used to smoothly create a monolayer of cells. The non-spreader slide is placed into a fixative solution that lyses red blood cells. The other is allowed to air dry and will be used for rapid H and E staining to ensure specimen accuracy. The remaining specimen is placed in an RPMI solution so that a cell block can be made. Once the specimen has been removed, the needle is flushed with peptide saline and then air. It's then ready to be used again. Squash or lift preparations, traditional blood smear techniques, smearing the same area of the slide twice, use of excessive pressure or use of two fully frosted slides, and delay in getting the smears into fixed solution should be avoided. It is ideal, though not necessary, to have rapid on-site cytologic evaluation or rows of the osprey so that stations with inadequate specimen may be resampled. Additionally, the finding of a positive nodal station, for instance, a contralateral N3 station, may negate the need to perform additional biopsies in more proximal stations. Regardless of whether rows is available, it's a useful thing for the operator to examine the specimens that they are obtained with the cytopathologist, as it provides a useful learning feedback loop. من الحاجات المهمة إن أنت وأنت بتدخل النيدل تغير الأنجل، يعني أنت دخلت كده وهي النيدل جوه الليمف نود تغير الأنجل تعمل الأول كده في الناحية دي وممكن تغير الأنجل دي بتدي ويلد أحسن وممكن تبقى تجيب مالجنت سيلز، إن أنت بتغير الأنجل وأنت جوه مش بتطلع بره خالص. دي من النقط المهمة. أوريكم آخر حاجة كده اللي هو الريديال بس تفهموا الريديال بروسيدر بيبقى إزاي ما يبقى فيه بروبلم اللي هي حكاية الدبل هيدج كيرين دي بتبقى ظريفة عشان تفهموا الميكانولوجي بتاعتها ده عباره عن انيميشن يورينا ازاي بيعمل الريدي لما يكون في بريفر هرمون ريفيول وموجوده في حته صعبه ان احنا نوصل لها هو بيدخل البروكوسكوب لغايه ما يوصل للليجن هنا الليجن موجود على الناحيه اللي هنا هو طب ما نطلع الالترا ساوند مش طبعا الصوره دي اللي سنو ستور ما فيها ما فيش حاجه مش قادر يشوف اي حاجه مش عارف يدخل مش عارف يدخل البروب كده فدخل اهو الدبل هيدج كيرات دخل عليها بعد كده الجاي تشيز طلع الجاي تشيز طلع الكريات ودخل بالسونار ابتدى بقى ياخد بالسونار بس طبعا الحركه دي بتبقى بالراحه يطلع ادي هوت تيومر اهو وباين الرينج موجود طلع البروب دخل البراش ابتدى يعمل بعد كده يدخل الايه؟ الفورسبس وده كل ده الجاي تشيز دي بالظبط الانيميشن ده ده اللي بيحصل بعد كده بيتراكت حسن عندك حاجة؟ في عندي سؤال كده يعني اتفضل على جيت لسه في فيديو اشتغل يا سيستر عندك في سيستر بقى اصلا بشرب دلوقتي لو في حتة بيوكس بقى طالعة والباقي تعمله سيرفر مش احنا صراحه ما بنعملش كده بس هو ده الكلاسيك ان انت اول بس تفرد سلايد واحده خلي بالك سلايد واحده سلايد واحده بس والباقي تعمله سيرفر بلوك بس المهم تبقى بتبقى هي القصه كلها ان انت بتبقى بتفرد سيرفر بلوك ان انت بتحطه في التيست تيوب بتبعته والراجل بقى بيعمل له سيرفيكيشن ويعمل سيرفر بلوكس من السيلز دي فانت لازم ان تبقى القصه ان انت تتفق مع سايكولوجيست المشكله ان احنا في مصر بنبعت للباثولوجيست يعني زي اللي هي اللي هي الباثولوجيست مش سايكولوجيست يعني صح ان احنا اول حاجه نفرد سلايد واحده والباقي نستخدمه سلايد او او حاجه بنحطها في السيل بلوك اه تكون متفق مع السايتولوجيست فالافضل ان انت تجيب تي بي ان اي او اي فايزيشن اسبيريشن عاوز سايتولوجيست مش باثولوجيست عشان كده اللي بيضيع النيجاتيف بيطلع الريزلتس بتاعتنا نيجاتيف كتير فرد السلايد زي ما انت شفت بس احنا ساعات فعلا واحنا بنفرد اول سلايد حتى بيطلع تيشو على السلايد ما هو اه لا فرد السلايد دي مشكله كبيره جدا عادي عاده بتكون بلوك كوجيليتيف بس هدول اللي في مش الحي هذا بلاد كوجريت هدول اللي لازم تحطهم في السلز اند بريك ذم يعني لانه بدك السلز هذا بلاد احنا ممكن السلايد نفسها نحطها ننزل منها انت لو طلع الحته دي بتاخدها بتبرد بتبرد بتاعت السلايد لو حاططها في السلز دي النقطه بس هي النقطه كلها ان انت لازم تبعت لسايتولوجيست مش لباثولوجيست حبشي هو سايتولوجيست اصلا 
هو بتاع سيتولوجي فهو حتى بيطلع لك بالليفاج حاجات ما بتطلعش من الناس الثانيه اللي بتطلع دايما يطلع لك حاجات بالليفاج حاجات من النيدلز بتبقى اه المفروض السيتولوجيست بيبقى اقوى من الباثولوجيست ان هو بيعتمد على السيلز والحاجات دي فتلاقيه ان هو بيشخص من شيء هم عددهم قليل السيتولوجيست عددهم قليل جدا اهم شيء يكون في سيتولوجيست ما بدي يطلع على تيشو ستراكشر بدي يطلع على الاي تي بي في السيلز حتى يقول لك شو بيجي عند ستينز كل ستينز بيقول لك شو هي سمول سيل نون سمول سيل طيب هيدا بس فيديو وحده كيس جست تو شو يو واتس وات از ريلي هابينينج سو ذس از ذا فيو هير So you do something called picture to picture usually. So you can have the uh, at the same time you're seeing the, uh, the scope, the endoscopic view, and the image. So for example, here you're seeing the azimuth. So this is what the sampling is happening. Uh, although you're not seeing anything, but you can tell from what you see that this is the azimuth. And then um, so here what's happening? Uh, so you, this is the carina here. And um, now they're going to probably deploy the needle, the, uh, the catheter. So you wait until you see the catheter coming out. So this is how much you need it. You don't need it to be out too much. If it's out too much, uh, So that what they said in the, vo uh, in the video, then you'll be, uh, you'll be away from the wall. So that's all you need, just to see a small crescent, to guarantee that your needle is not going to push. And here you're against the grind, you're interrogating the grind. I think this is my fellow, he's unable to go, he's trying to go in the left and he's unable to. Uh, it, it's because he's, you're seeing too much of the lumen. So this is another way of get, getting in, you, you just go backwards. And here you're seeing the subcarinal. So now this is the subcarinal. This is the cardiac movements under it. This is the pericardium here. You see in the pericardium. And this is the subcarinal. Uh, you can see the interface was circumscribed, and there's a blood vessel here. Uh, I'm sure. And the needle is going to come out from here. So you jab it. You don't try to uh, push it. And then you move your wire inside. If you see this movement, uh, that's the wire being moved. Uh, Sorry, the stylet or the wire, yeah. So this movement is the stylet you move to get the debris out. And you maybe see the debris here. And then you move your uh, needle in and out. And uh, I'm not sure who's going to do it, but here you can, you can change the angle. By relaxing your, your, your thumb, you can change the angle of the uh, needle and do a fanning technique. So you do it about 20 times over uh, So they were back to ultrasound while they're uh, working on the sample. So here you go into the uh, right main stem and again he's trying to get to the main stem. So you saw an expert here, my fellow is, is doing it. الاندوسكوبيك فيو مشكله كبيره بتلاقي الصوره اولا دي سب سكرين فمشكله ما بتبقاش شايف تاني حاجه بالذات في الاولمبس بتبقى الدنيا مسنقه عشان الانجل 35 والفيو والفيلد فيو 80 فتلاقي ان الدنيا شايف بتبقى تحس ان انت مش شايف حاجه. So here let me see what they're showing I think this is a significant mass it's probably the AP window. Uh, so here they're against the left side so this is the AP window. So here this is the aorta. Uh, and this is the mass here, and you're not seeing the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is squished here, okay? So again, just to, just to appreciate what we're doing. So here you're in the trachea. This, this is exactly where you're going to see the uh, AP window. So you're going to go against the wall. This is the aorta. This is the mass. This is the pulmonary artery. You're not seeing really the uh, Mickey Mouse because the mass is so big. So this is the, the, uh, the pulmonary artery that's squished. And now you're going in the left main stem. 
And now this is the, all right, so here you're in the left. And now you've seen it from below, and you still, it's a, it's a station forward, thus you've seen the whole mass now. So here you're in the left, uh, left main stand. So this is the, uh, the tip of it is the AT. If you advance a bit, then it's the high level. This is the whole mass. It's a big, very big uh, uh, lymph node. And now they're, they're probably going to deploy the uh, catheter again, the sheet again. It's taking time probably to get it. But it's very important to make sure the sheet is out. Never puncture without the sheet out. Uh, and you should, you, your uh, scope should be in a neutral position. Otherwise, you can even in injure the uh, scope if you're against the wall, uh, even from the sheet without the, uh, the needle. Oh, so now it's, it's out. And uh, trying to get it in the right position. And now you're seeing the mass. And you can deploy the needle. You saw the needle coming out, but it pushed the image away. So that's what's happening usually. Trying to get a good vision. Okay. Here, when you see this, it means the balloon is uh, inflated. And now this is the, your dot, and this is where the uh, needle is going to come out. This is the balloon being inflated here. You can see it on the uh, endoscopic view. and try to avoid the areas that look like uh, blood vessels or necrotic for you. So again, this is the pulmonary artery under this lesion. And this is air artifact here that you see, and I showed you that, because you don't have good opposition. This is all air, air artifact. Still on the left here. All right, so I, I thought we'll review some cases since we don't have the simulator. So this is the case of a 62-year-old uh, male uh, who on a CT had a 2.5 by 2 centimeter right upper lobe lesion that you see here. Um, okay. Um, and at the same time, on the medial standard view, uh, with this contrast CT, you can see a 1.8 by 1.2 centimeter um, 2R lymph node. So you, you see that um, here you're at the level of the uh, arch, and uh, this is the bronchus intermedius, uh, sorry, not the intermedius, the, uh, the innominate, uh, the left innominate uh, above the SVC, as it enters the SVC here. So this is still 2R. And uh, on the on the pad, there's uptake in the right upper lobe lesion, but no uptake in the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is negative. So what do you do? Bronchoscopy, lobectomy, transthoracic needle aspiration, EUS, EBUS, or mediastinoscopy. The pad is negative. You have a lymph node, and you have uh, a lesion. Any other idea? Would you all do EMAS on a bet negative lymph node? Huh? Go back to me right away. Okay. So actually, even if the bet is negative, if you have a circumscribed 
uh, lymph node, you should sample it. Okay, so the PET scan does not obviate the need to sample a, a lesion. Okay, because if uh, you're not going to do the rectum before you know, maybe it's a small cell, right? You're not, you can't just do the rectum without knowing what you have. Okay, if you do a TTNA, you can get your diagnosis, but you won't know the stage. So, EWAS is the, or mediastinoscopy will give you the stage and the diagnosis at the same time with one procedure, but EWAS is, uh, is easier. While EOS will not get to the right side. Okay, so that's why it's the procedure of choice. And bronchoscopy won't get to it. So this is the, uh, the lymph node next to, next to the SVC. You get the EWAS DNA and it turned out to be adenosine egg. So it's not unusual for adenosine egg to be negative on PET, okay? And now you know that you have uh, a T1, N2 lymph node. Uh, T1, N2 uh, stage with an uh, N2 lymph node, then you're at 3A. So you would give neoadjuvant chemotherapy before you would, uh, you would do a uh, surgery. Usually that's the standard of care, is to give neoadjuvant. Uh, so that's what happened. So this is another case, 60-year-old uh, female with uh, left lower lobe 1.1 times 2 centimeter lesion and she has the uh, 4L lymph node plus 5, station 5 here. Uh, the lesion and the lymph node are positive on PET. Okay, so what do you do? Would you consider this is uh, stage 3A and start chemotherapy similar to the other patient? Would you do bronchoscopy, EOS, EBUS, or mediastinoscopy? Oh well, yeah, if you want to get to those, but you can get to this for our lymph node here, for L lymph node here. Okay, so you can get to that by EOS or EBUS. And this is the smaller lymph node. The other lymph nodes are not showing; they are bigger, five or six. I mean, you can get the. If you can get to it endoscopically, why would you want to do surgery? So this turned out to be small cell lung cancer. So no surgery, just chemo and radiation. This is another case, 60 year old uh, female with recently diagnosed breast cancer. She underwent PET scan uh, for staging and showed the PET positive mediastinal adenopathy. So again, what would you do? Start chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer, do a need or EBUS FNA? No. Now you're, you're, you're guessing, it's always EWAS. The answer is always EWAS in this uh, presentation. So you do the EWAS of the subcranial and it shows non caseating granulomas compatible with sarcoidosis. This is a real case, okay? So if you, didn't, if you just believe the PET scan and you didn't do surgery for this lady, just they gave her chemo and radiation, you would have potentially prevented her from having a curative surgery. Uh, I had at least, you know, three or four cases like this, typical breast cancer, diffuse mediastinal adenopathy, they have stage one sarcoidosis, and breast cancer, both, you know, breast cancer, very common, and sarcoidosis is, you know, relatively common in the uh, practice of a pulmonologist, at least. So what happens is that uh, she had radical mastectomy with lymph node dissection. This is another case, 70 year old male with a one centimeter left upper lobe uh, lung lesion, that's not involving the main bronchus, so it's circumscribed. The PET CT shows a PET positive limb adenopathy at level 10L, 7, 4L, and 4R. So multiple uh, uh, levels. So which node would you sample? Okay, remember, left upper lobe lesion and all these. So which one, which node would you go to first? The 10, the 7, the 4L, or the 4R? Okay. I have to go to the contralateral of the film. So you have to go to the 4R, for, because it's the N3. Okay, so the first one would be, would be this one. Okay, the, the 7 and the 10L, uh, sorry, the 7 and the 4L are N2 lymph nodes. This is N3, because it's on the other side. And this is N1, okay? So this is gonna be 3B, these two are gonna be 3A, and this one's gonna be 2. Okay, because this is a T1 lesion. So uh, with the left lung lesion, 4R would be, uh, that's what I just said, it's just 
repeating what I said. So this, these are the images uh, for the 4R. For Cytology was positive. So the patient had uh, T1 and 3, non-small cell lung CA, so given chemo rather, okay? Because there's no benefit from doing surgery in 3B. So uh, we do chemo <coughs> radiation. This is another case, 70 year old male with a two centimeter right upper low uh, mass, FNA of the mass showed uh, squamous cell lung cancer. PET scan showed PET positive subcarinal and paratracheal lymph nodes. So you already have a diagnosis here, okay, and of squamous cell, and you do a PET that is positive. Are you satisfied? Would you proceed with lobectomy? Would you start new adjuvant because this is a PET positive uh, lymph nodes, meaning it's cancer, um, and give uh, chemotherapy, or would you do a media stenoscopy uh, to verify, or EBUS of the subcarinal and 4R lymph nodes? Hmm? EBUS, why? Because the false positive, no, so the, in the PET, it's 15% false positive, okay? So 85% of the time, when the PET is positive in the lymph node, it's true positive, but in 15%, it could be, you know, like the cases I told you, sarcoidosis, inflammation, something else. And there's a 20% false negative. So, like the first case, there was the lymph node and the PET was negative, especially in adenosine A. 20% would be negative, even if, the, uh, if there's cancer. So you always need to very not always, but you need to verify. There's two conditions, two conditions only where you don't need to verify. If the CT, is negative, and the lesion is peripheral. So in stage one, peripheral lesion, okay, and the CT is negative, meaning there's no lymphadenopathy, and the PET is negative, then that's the only situation where you actually can go straight to surgery. You don't need to verify the findings. But if any is discrepant, discrepant then you need to do. So if either the CT is positive or the PET is positive, then you need to do an invasive staging. And the other condition, if the lesion is proximal, Meaning it's uh, uh, it's not distal like this lesion. So if it's it's in within the uh, proximal two third of the lung, then you always need to stage the mediastinum, even if the PET and the CT are negative. Okay. So the uh, so the two conditions where you don't need to stage the mediastinum invasively, peripheral lesion with PET negative, CT negative, or if the tumor is actually invading the mediastinum, you don't need to stage the mediastinum. Consider that it's possible. So only two. So here you can do either EBUS or uh, media stenoscopy. Uh, 4R or 7 correspond to an N2 involvement, 3A. Lack of lymph node involvement make the tumor stage 1. So you really need to uh, uh, differentiate. And you can't believe the PET 100% of the time. You can only believe it 85% of the time. So on EBUS FNA, it turned out to be a reactive. And I've had so many cases of those. Um, uh, negative for malignancy with uh, stage 1. So the patient had a right upper lobectomy. Uh, and on the lymph node dissection, it confirmed that these, these were negative lymph nodes. So just a few cases, just to give you an idea of what you may face uh, in your decisions. I'll take questions.